We are live. Good morning. Uh, the meeting will now come to order. Welcome to the March 23rd, 2021 meeting of the uh, Durham Board of Adjustment. My name is Jacob Rogers. I'm the chair of the board. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are conducting this meeting using a remote electronic platform as permitted by session law 2020-3. The Board of Adjustment is a quasi-judicial body that is governed by the North Carolina General Statutes and the City's Unified Development Ordinance. The Board typically conducts evidentiary hearings on requests for variances, special use permits, among other requests. Today's meeting will proceed much like an in-person meeting of the Board. On the screen, you'll see members of the Board of Adjustment. Additionally, planning staff and representatives from the City and County's Attorney's Offices are attending in the remote meeting. Applicants, proponents, and opponents were required to register in advance and are also attending the remote meeting. When a case is called for its hearing, speakers will be promoted within the platform so their video can be seen. The chair will swear in applicants and witnesses at the beginning of each case. Staff will present each case and applicants will then provide their evidence. Control of the presentation and screen sharing will remain with planning staff. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on the city's YouTube site and a link to this broadcast is on the website for the Board of Adjustment. Before we begin the evidentiary hearings on today's agenda, I would like to provide some important information about the steps taken to ensure that each party's due process rights are protected as we proceed in this remote platform. Each applicant on today's agenda was notified that this meeting would be conducting using a remote electronic platform. During registration, every applicant on today's agenda consented to the board conducting the evidentiary hearing using this remote platform. We will also confirm today at the start of each hearing that the participants in the hearing consent to the matter uh, proceeding in this remote platform. If there is any objection to a matter proceeding in this remote platform, the case will be continued. Notice of today's meeting was provided by publishing notice in the newspaper mailed to property owners within 600 feet of the subject properties, posting a sign at the property and posting on the city's website. The newspaper website and mailed notices for today's meeting uh, contained information how the public can access uh, the remote meeting as it occurs. These notices also contained information about the registration requirement for the meeting, along with information about how to register. All individuals participating in today's evidentiary hearings were also required to submit a copy of any presentation, document, exhibit, or other material that they wish to submit at the hearing prior to today's meeting. All materials that the city received from the participants in today's cases, as well as a copy of the city staff's presentations and documents were posted on the Board of Adjustment website as part of the agenda. No new documents will be submitted during today's meeting. All decisions of this board are subject to appeal to the Durham Superior Court. Anyone in the audience other than the applicant who wishes to receive a copy of the formal order issued by the board on a particular case must submit a written uh, request for a copy of the order. I want to welcome everyone here. Um, Madam Clerk, would you like to call the roll? Jacob Rogers. Here. Chad Meadows. Here. Regina DeLacy. Here. Micah Jeter. Ian Kipp. Here. Michael Retchless. Here. Tisha Wymore. Here. Jessica Major. Here. Michael Tarrant. Here. Natalie Boucher. Even though my headphones are now out. All right. Um, I was contacted by Natalie. Uh, she wasn't going to be here, but she requested a an excused absence. Um, do we need a motion and approval on that? So Chris is saying yes. So is there a motion for an excused absence for Natalie? Retchless motion. Yep, second. Um, and and okay. Uh, I guess do we need to? Susan, do you need to call everyone? Yes. Uh, Jacob Rogers. Yes. Chad Meadows. Yes. Regina DeLacy. Yes. Ian Kipp. Yes. Michael Retchless. Yes. Tisha Wymore. Yes. Jessica Major. Yes. Michael Tarrant. Yes. All right. Uh, thank you for that. And um, hopefully everybody had an opportunity to review the minutes from our February meeting. Is there a uh, a motion to approve this. Second. 
DeLacy, I move that we accept the minutes as submitted. Motion by DeLacy, is there a second? That's close second. All right, Susan, would you like to call everyone? Jacob Rogers. Yes. Chad Meadows. Yes. Regina DeLacy. Yes. Ian Kipp. Yes. Michael Retchless. Yes. Keisha Wymore. Yes. Jessica Major. Yes. Michael Tarrant. Yes. Um, uh, Susan, would you like to call the first case? Yes, case B21000006. This case was continued from February. A request for a variance from the vehicular use area landscaping requirements. The subject site is located at 2152 and 2362 Soha Drive and 224 Northeast Creek Parkway. It's zoned Science Research Park and in the suburban tier. And this case has been advertised for the required period of time and property owners within 600 feet have been notified, notarized affidavits verifying the sign postings and letter mailings are on file. And to verify the seating for this case, it will be Mr. Tarrant, Ms. Wymore, Mr. Retchless, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Kipp, and Mr. Lacey. Thank you, Susan. Uh, would we go ahead and promote the, um, the applicants for this case for the oath? Mr. Chair, may I interrupt? I, I don't believe I was seated for this case last month. All right. Uh, Susan or who's? We could put Miss Major seat Miss Major for this case. No, the seating the seating has to be the same since it was oh. continued. Okay, okay. So I guess the seating there would be six members of the board. Miss DeLacy, Mr. Kip, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Retchless, and Miss Wymore. There right, so in which in which case um, the applicant would have to consent to go forward with less than seven. Right. But it was my understanding that the applicant with either withdrew this uh, application. Uh, if this is the same case, I thought they would the application. This is Jessica Dockery. I apologize. Eliza's having some technical difficulties, it looks like. Um, this has actually been withdrawn by request of the applicant. Right. That's what I thought. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to actually chime in. I was trying to get a chime in, but Mr. Chair, I actually have some uh, revisions to the agenda. I was trying to flag in to mention those during that time, but um, unfortunately was unable to. Uh, but as Jessica Dockery stated, this case was withdrawn um, as well as the motions at the end of the hearing have been withdrawn. Uh, so those are the changes to the agenda that staff would like to mention before we get underway. Thank you for that. All righty. Well, then we will continue. Um, Susan, would you like to call the next case? Case B2000049. Request for a minor special use permit for a daycare in a residential zoning district. The subject site is located at 2416 Pickett Road, zoned residential suburban and in the suburban tier. This case has been advertised for the required period of time and property owners within 600 feet have been notarized notarized affidavits verifying the sign postings and letter mailings are on file. And to clarify the seating for this case, it will be Mr. Tarrant, Ms. Wymore, Mr. Retchless, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Kipp, and Ms. DeLacy. All righty. Uh, are the um, applicants on? Okay, good, good. Uh, Mr. Royster, we'll have to see you as well. I think we, uh, Cole, could you, would you mind uh, stop sharing until we uh, do that? Oh, yeah, sorry, my bad. No uh, worries. One second. Well, I'm trying to, hold on. No worries. 
All right, I think, uh, I think we've got everybody here. Uh, anyone who plans to give testimony on this one, please raise your right hand. Uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Mr. Royster, I, we, we have to have a, okay. I do. All right. And uh, do you uh, consent to uh, this remote meeting platform? I do. Yes, sir. All right. Um, Eliza. That's me, actually. Oh, cool. <laughs> so, I knew that. All right. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Cole Renegar, um, representing the planning and staff. Um, please note that all um, the staff report and all materials submitted to the public hearing to be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. So noted, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Case B200009 um, is a minor special permit for a daycare in a residential zoning district. Uh, the case area is highlighted in red. The site is in the suburban tier zone residential suburban RS10 and then within the city of Durham jurisdiction. The existing use is single family. Uh, Chrissy, Chrissy Snyder, applicant um, be, on behalf of Wild Hot College, proposes to convert the existing 2,861 square foot building um, to a daycare. A new addition of 591 square feet will also be added for a total of 3,425 square feet for a daycare on a parcel zone residential suburban RS10 located in the suburban development tier. Per unified development ordinance, Section 5.1.2, a daycare and a residential zoning is, is allowed with an approved minor special use permit. Um, a site plan, case D2000274, is currently under review this project and is included as an attachment to the application. Um, UDO section 3.9.8A and B establish four findings and 13 review factors the applicant must meet in order under the board to grant a use permit. These findings and review factors are identified in the staff report and the applicant's response to the findings and review factors are identified in the application, both within your packet. Um, staff will be available for any questions um, as needed during the meeting. All right, uh, any questions for Cole before we move forward? Shifting through here, shifting through here. All righty. Um, would the applicant like to say a few words? Mr. Chair, this is Paul Young. Um, my understanding is that Chrissy is here somewhere, but I do not see her on the screen. Um, I saw her in the participants. Um, maybe we could have her promoted. We apologize about that. Sorry. No worries. I'll come over. All right. Um, Ms. Snyder, uh, I don't think you, we had you uh, uh, swear in, so we'll need to administer the oath with you as well. If you'll raise your right hand, uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? Hey, I also swear in. Okay. Oh. Chrissy, I think I think you're muted still. Um, we can't hear you. And uh, Nick, Mr. Kirkland, are you going to be giving as well? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. And, and Ms. Snyder, I'm, I don't think we heard you either. I do. Okay. Uh, do you both um, consent to this remote meeting platform? I do. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. Young, did you want Ms. Snyder? Who, who, who wants to go first? I'll let uh, Chrissy go first. Um, I didn't prepare anything. Um, we, we began this small nonprofit program in January of 2017, and we've fallen in love with the neighborhood. 
And we're looking forward to continuing to serve the community. And Mr. Chair, this is Paul Young uh, with DTW Architects. Um, I am a registered architect in the state of North Carolina, and I'm a partner with DTW Architects and Planners located at 229 North Craigson Street. Um, I do not have a presentation to give today, but I am here to answer any questions that you might have. We also have uh, Nick Kirkland here um, to answer any questions about the appraisal that you might have. All right. Uh, well, does the board have any questions for Mr. Young or, or any of the uh, applicants? Uh, Mr. Meadows, I see a hand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning. Um, I, I have a couple of questions. Uh, I, I understand that the, uh, the, the daycare is uh, going to be using um, shared parking uh, next door with with the church would you elaborate a little more on two things one the the number of kids that you would anticipate on a regular day um the hours that they'll be on the site and then finally why the decision was made not to provide any on-site parking so we're planning to serve 45 children which is what we're currently serving within the church. Um, we will plan to go back to our 7.30 to 5.30 hours. We've been running reduced hours um, during the pandemic. And um, the church is um, happy to partner with us. They have more than required parking and we just wanted to maintain the trees and the grass and the green charm of this property. Uh, follow up, Mr. Chair? Absolutely. Um, thank you, and I appreciate that. One last question. I assume that in order for the kids to get from the, uh, let's say mom and dad park in the parking lot and it's time to either walk in or, or, or leave, um, I assume the children are accompanied by the parents as they walk from the building to the, the cars that are parked next door and it's necessary to uh, cross the driveway and walk and, and walk along a new sidewalk that, that you guys are constructing. Is that, is that accurate? Yes. And have you considered the possibility of uh, a dedicated walkway from the site to the, um, to the parking lot? Uh, so that kids don't have to cross over the driveway. I'm not sure if we have considered that. Um, the driveway won't be used for anything except one handicapped parking space. Mm -hmm. So it, it won't have any traffic coming and going. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Um, Mr. Tarrant? Yes, um, it, it's hard to tell from the, the plans. I apologize if I've overlooked it, but is there any increase in impervious surface that, that is being accounted for in some fashion with this proposal? I'll let Mr. Royster adjust, uh, address that one. Sure, there's actually a decrease in impervious surface proposed for this project. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? All right, is there any, um, all right, anyone else uh, here to speak in favor of this application? And and I'm, I'm gonna look to you, Ms. Snyder, Mr. Young to, to tell me, uh, uh, Krista, you got something? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, Chris Cucur, City Attorney's Office. Um, I just want to remind the board of the um, obligation that it has in considering a minor special use permit. Um, the UDO sets out the criteria. Those are in the staff report that was provided to you. One of the factors is um, a finding that the project is not substantially injurious to the value of the properties in the general vicinity. Um, 
based on my observation of the agenda, there was not an appraisal um, submitted with the packet. Um, so I would urge the board to uh, make a further inquiry on that point um, in terms of um, the values, valuation of the property. I believe there's someone here to speak on that. Um, so that would be my recommendation before you all move on um, past the folks who are here to speak in support of the application. Absolutely, uh, it's a question that I was gonna have. Uh, Mr. Young, do you have an appraiser or someone here to speak about property values? I thought I heard you say something about that. We do, and I apologize. I thought that information was submitted in time, but we do have uh, Nick Kirkland here to speak about the uh, appraisal that was done for the property. Hi, my name is Nick Kirkland. I apologize that that didn't get submitted. That was supposed to have gotten submitted. I, I apologize for that. But I'll go ahead and walk you through what we've done. Uh, I'm a licensed residential appraiser. Uh, I've been accepted as an expert in property value impacts and hearings just like this over five dozen times. Um, I'm here to present the Kirkland Appraisals Impact Study. Uh, that impact study, what we've done is we've addressed both the harmony of use as well as the potential to impact the adjoining property values. So to do this, first what we've done is we've looked at other daycare facilities in the area to determine first, where are they commonly located? And second, what commonly adjoins them? Uh, what we found is they are most commonly located in residential areas with residential uses being the most predominant adjoining use. Um, some are located on uh, the ends of neighborhoods, specifically looking at the renovated house uh, take care facilities, just like this one. They tend to adjoin one commercial use being as they're on the ends of neighborhoods. Uh, but the proposed site is very similar to where uh, other daycare facilities are located. And based on this information, it is my professional opinion that the proposed site will be a harmonious use in its location to determine whether or not it would impact the adjoining property values. We've done something that's called a matched pair or a paired sales analysis. Um, this is an, a methodology that's supported by the Appraisal Institute and it's actually outlined in detail in the Appraisal Institute textbook, Real Estate Damages, which is written by Dr. Randall Bell. Uh, to do this match pair study, what we've done is we've looked at homes that have sold adjacent to daycare facilities in Durham and compared those to homes that sold that were not adjacent to daycare facilities in order to measure for any difference. We have identified a number of match pairs within the impact study that show no significant impact to the adjoining property values for those homes that sold that were adjacent to the daycare facilities. They were within typical market friction of one to 5%, both positive and negative, uh, when looking at the median prices per square foot. And therefore, based on this information, it is my professional opinion that the proposed use will not impact the adjoining property values. And I'm happy to go into more detail or answer any questions that you have. Any questions for Mr. Kirkland? From the board? And is there a submission or something we could just glance at? There is. Um, I can, I'm, am I allowed to share? If I can, I will share that with you. Don't think so. Um, okay. Yeah, planning, planning would like to say that um, we didn't receive an official report. Um, if one was submitted, um, it wasn't submitted in time for it to be part of the presentation. Um, and even yesterday, uh, we actually added uh, Mr. Kirkland to the register because he missed that deadline as well. I apologize for that. I thought it had been submitted in time. Any other questions for Mr. Kirkland? All right. Um, I do have a question for the applicant. I, you know, just kind of for the record and for the folks who are here, uh, what's the relationship between the church and uh, Wildflowers Cottage? They've been our landlord and certainly supported us in many intangible ways, but landlord. <laughs> All right, any other questions for, for the applicant? Um, Mr. Retchels? Yes, um, hi, I'm Snyder Retchels here. Is this house, um, is, is the, is the only use you want to have it for is for daycare? Is there anybody living there? I know it's a two story. No, the upstairs rooms would be used for conference in office, 
storage. Thank you. May I ask if have any other neighbors uh, been notified or talked to you or has there been any feedback from the neighborhood at all? In addition to the letter that you all sent, I sent personal letters to everyone um, within a thousand square feet. I only had um, one gentleman call me last week just to reiterate um, that we're going to not um, impede any of the um, storm water in the forest. Um, and I think made a quick friend. He's decided to provide the children with seeds to plant. <laughs> but I haven't received any other comments at all. I do have a number of families um, in close proximity who have enrolled their children with us and often walk to school. And some of them may actually even be here this morning willing to speak. Chair Rogers, this is Jessica Dockery of the Planning Department. We do actually have quite a few people waiting in the wings who may wish to speak in support or opposition. If it's in support, you because it's such a large group, you may want to consider asking for a representative but I leave that to you. Uh, first, before we get that, uh, I think Mr. Meadows has got a question. Thank you, Chair Rogers, I do. I, I have a couple questions. I, um, Ms. Snyder, thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing. I appreciate that. And I know that this has been a long process for you. Um, you know, we have a variety of findings that we have to make in order to approve your, um, your proposal. And among those are how you'll be addressing you know, circulation, parking, loading, service entrances, lighting. Um, I, I guess there are some play areas that are outside. I did not see that on the site plan. Would you talk a little bit more about the, the plans for outdoor activity, um, the, the, the kind of operational aspects, trash pickup, um, and, and just a little bit more about the kind of circulation pick up and drop off process that you anticipate um, on, a, on a daily basis uh, or, or whenever you're open. Thank you. All right, so someone um, might be able to step up with more official information. So um, when it's a full day childcare program, there's not a hard and fast um, start time and end time. So families will arrive and park um, at the church, I'd say between 7.30 and 9. Um, trickle in and trickle out. Um, afternoon would probably be between 3.30 and 5.30. Um, we will just be pushing regular city rolling carts out to the street for trash and recycling the volume that we've been using um, has at the church has been supported by that type of waste management. Um, the playground, um, it seems like we may have put some type of proposal. There's already um, a wooden picket fence in a portion of the backyard there. Um, and it will just be um, expanded to the left. Um, it's you know not coming up to the street. That's just the front yard. Um, yes, yeah. you can see the uh, fence there on your screen. Um, the existing fence to the uh, currently to the top there, uh, and then wrapping around the back, and new fence starting about there where the hand is, and then continuing around to the bottom of the screen, and then back up to the side of the house. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Meadows. One last question: How many employees on a on a regular sort of a day, a, a, a typical day? Um, I would say around ten full time. All right. Any other questions? 
All right. Um, let's let's hear from some of the public in support of this. If they're, um, I think uh, I think the best thing to do here, Cole, is to to stop sharing and um, see folks. Um, is there if if there if uh, if there are a lot of people, of course, I can't tell who is in, uh, signed up to speak in favor for word or, or against what. But um, if there are multiple folks who are wanting to speak in favor of this, maybe we could uh, hear from a single representative and, and just have the others uh, either raise their hand or wave or or show some support that way. Um, Here, this is Chris Peterson. Can I recommend I lower all the hands and have them raise hands again for those who wish to speak as a representative? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. All right, stand by. Okay, um, if you could please raise your hand now if you wish to speak. Let's hear from them all. All right, I'm gonna bring them all in. Um, for those of you, there'll be about a five second delay. Um, so bear with me one second, let me bring you all in. Mr. Chair, while um, that's occurring, Krista Kukuro, City Attorney's Office, um, I'd like to make the recommendation that I, I believe there's gonna be a lot of people speaking. Um, and so when you administer the oath and ask for um, the consent to the remote meeting platform um, that you sort of maybe just call people by their first or last name um, and have them respond rather than us sort of waiting for people to respond in some random order or just kind of in unison. I think that's the clearest way to get that in the record. Sounds good. All right. Uh, anyone who, who plans on giving any testimony today uh, will have to administer the oath. Your camera must be on as well. Um, so I, I see a few people here. Um, and just looking through here, both screens. And their hands came down. So may I recommend maybe you have them raise their hands, the, the digital raise hands <laughs> first. Thank you. And we'll also have, have you raise your hand again. Um, so uh, if you do plan on giving testimony, please raise your right hand. We'll administer the oath. Uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? And we'll come by each one of you that I have here. Uh, Jordan Glassman? I do. Tobias Walter? I do. Zachary Lamprin? I do. John Hill? I do. Joshua Klein? I do. Uh, Oh, down at um, Garija Mahajan. Yes, Garija Mahajan, I do. All right. Um, I think that uh, Cynthia Satterfield. I do. Uh, Claire Dennis. I do. And I'm Miss Jennings. I can't see your first name. Sorry. Johanna Jennings. I do. Uh, Scott Anderson. I do. I think that is everyone. Um, so I think I'm gonna go go first here. Uh, uh, Jordan Glassman, would you like to start with some comments? Sure. Uh, thank you members of the board for uh, giving me the chance to speak here. Uh, my name is Jordan Glassman and I along with my uh, partner Beth Bennett are homeowners at 2626 Chapel Hill uh, Road a few short hundred feet away from the, uh, from the new property. Our, our, our son River is a uh, precocious 22 months old and has been at Wildflower uh, since the moment we were able to enroll him there. Uh, at 22 months, he does a lot of chattering now. And uh, when he leaves every day, he's usually sort of rattling off the names of his five classmates as best he can and telling us about his, his good day, his good day, uh, <laughs> usually wearing muddy shoes uh, and probably babbling some new word that we needed to decipher. Um, although last week was easy because uh, the word was cookie because there were four leaf clover shaped cookies that were given to the kids and cookie comes through loud and clear. Uh, at the end of every day, River is in a fantastic mood and still full of energy in spite of the activities that they have set up for them there. And we're grateful that uh, Wildflower is available to keep them safe and learning and, and socializing even in these difficult times. I'd like to say first that I believe that Wildflower is harmonious with the neighborhood. It's beneficial to young families. It increases the values of the uh, surrounding properties. I don't know what could be more valuable to a new family than a daycare within 
a comfortable walking distance. Wildflower embodies many of the goals that Durham has for its city, including collaboration with others, eco-healthy practices, instruction on social justice, synergy with nonprofits, and strong community values. About the parking situation, I will say that uh, the number of children at Wildflower equals the number of children being proposed at the new space. There's not going to be any traffic increase uh, with the variance. Every day we drop off river at the same time. Every day we pick them up at the same time. There has never been a wait. There's never a line of cars. Uh, the the uh, Wildflower carefully chooses the times and staggers the times. There's no rush time. Um, there will be no line extending into the road. It's never happened. I've never waited more than, than 30 seconds uh, when dropping or picking a river off. And they actually have recently started using a new app that makes it very possible, very easy to change the times and be very flexible uh, in order to um, uh, message parents and adjust that time as needed to make sure that there is no wait. Uh, Wildflower, Wildflower does and intends to be home-like and to maintain the existing residential look of the neighborhood. There's not going to be any prominent or ugly signs, no dumpster, no new parking lot, no clearing of forests, no commercial gaudy play, playground equipment. Uh, you know, they spend so much time outside in nature that, like I said, he's regularly coming home uh, muddy. We often see pictures of the kids playing with plants, dirt, nature, other natural items. Um, and uh, I, I couldn't be any happier about Wildflower, and I support uh, this variance uh, as, as strongly as I can, both as a parent of, uh, of uh, um, someone who has a kid in Wildflower, as well as a very close by homeowner. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Mr. Glassman, uh, wanna, uh, I know we've got a lot of folks here, and I'm not sure if we've got anybody else to speak uh, in favor or against, but um, uh, I uh, appreciate the, that opportunity. Um, I'm looking at my screen here. Ms. Uh, Mahajan, would you like to? Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll keep my remarks brief. Um, since 2017, our children have been part of the Wildflower Cottage community. On our first tour of the facility, we found the space to be a magical blend of individual and community-based learning spaces, child-centered curriculum that aligns with our family values of intergenerational community, nature-based education, um, understanding a uh, child's uh, place in space, uh, both in nature as well as in the community, and just plain fun. Over the years, we've been excited to learn about Miss Chrissy and the Wildflower Board's desire to move to their forever home, uh, 2416 Pickett Road. We at times have provided feedback on the plan and believe it will be another beautifully constructed child-centered space. I specifically want to speak about Miss Chrissy's creative, innovative, um, just uh, a you know, shift in uh, operations during this pandemic. Last June, when Ms. Chrissy decided to reopen, she thoughtfully constructed new procedures that limited health exposures, but minimized stress and anxiety for young children and their families. This was an absolute lifeline for my partner and I as we were still juggling work responsibilities. Uh, the procedures around drop off and pick up are clear and parents walk hand in hand with their children to and from the facility. I hope the board will support the decision to make the adjustment to let Wildflower move into their new facility, specifically because Ms. Chrissy and the Wildflower Board have been so thoughtful about engaging all stakeholders in this process. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, Tobias Walter. Yes, I'll keep my, uh, my support of this brief as well. Um, I am a neighbor just about 500 feet away from the proposed location. And my son Lars also goes to Wildflower. He started uh, last fall uh, when the pandemic started lifting. We're, we're extremely thankful for, for the helping hands at Wildflower. Um, I support everything that, that the two prior speakers um, said as well. I love this idea of being able to take my stroller and go, actually we went the whole winter. Um, I don't think I've, I've picked him up a single time in my car um, and it's great to see things so I think there was one morning where there were three strollers in the line on a um, on a sidewalk all moving towards wildflower which was great to see um, so I love having them in the neighborhood I think they are a really great addition to the neighborhood and, and make this feel like home and warm um, I've been very interested in the plans too and support the part right of there's there's no trees that are no forests that are being cut down um, this is not going to look like a new commercial building um, I myself here in my location have been renovating a 120 year old house 
uh, for the last year and a half. And I've been great to see those plans. And it, I think it fits really well in the neighborhood um, or, you know, stays in, in that way and, and, and thus really fits in the neighborhood. And it's a great harmonious relationship uh, with, with neighbors, parents, staff um, throughout. So I'm, I'm heavily in support um, of this as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, Zachary Lampard. Yes, good morning. Um, I'm a, a parent of a child at Wildflower and also a, a neighbor. I'm, I'm one of those strollers in the line uh, with Mr. Walter uh, often heading to pick up my daughter Juniper from Wildflower. Um, we're, we're very lucky to live within walking distance um, and actually the proposed move would bring the daycare about 50 yards closer to our house. So that's my, my disclaimer, I guess, um, uh, but very much uh, as with others in support um, of this move, you know, like many families, um, last year in the fall we were struggling to balance um, child care and work uh, so when a spot opened up at wildflower you know it's such a good program and so close to our home uh, it really provides us with tremendous peace of mind um, knowing that our daughter uh, is in a uh, taken care of in a home-like environment where she spends as others have said a large part of her day um, outside with river um, getting filthy um, uh, that's really important to us and allows us to focus um, on our job so our daughter's 19 months old, so um, she's a, maybe not a woman of few words, but a woman of very short sentences. Um, but we can, we can tell how much she loves Wildflower. Every morning uh, when we get her ready, we say, are you ready to go to school? And, and she's, she's very good at saying no. She hasn't quite mastered the word yes, um, but she often just laughs uh, in places where you would expect her to say yes. So we ask her if she's excited to go and she laughs. Are you excited to see Miss Lila, Miss Shana, all of her friends, um, and she's just laughing all the way out the door. So we're really, really happy to be able to, to send her there. Um, regarding the move, as others have mentioned, um, we're excited that on the occasions that we do need to drive, um, pick up and drop off are gonna be just as smooth. Um, parking will remain the same. I'm happy to be able to go to the same lot, have the same safe walk in and out of the building, um, and that there won't be a traffic increase. I think having a high quality daycare like Wildflower within walking distance um, for us and other neighbors um, is, a, is a huge asset um, to the neighborhood. And so really happy to have the opportunity to speak in favor of the move to the proposed space and, and happy to be a part of the Wildflower family. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Claire Dennis. Mr. Chair. Oh, Krista, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, Krista Cooper, City Attorney's Office. Um, I realize that we have several more speakers. I just want to um, offer uh, that um, it might be helpful to limit non-repetitive testimony um, and testimony that is relevant to the factors. Um, I've heard some comments on circulation, traffic and things like that. Um, I think that that's what, what the board needs to hear about in terms of um, making its decision today and, and attorney Wardell dropped those into the chat believe everybody can see those. Um, most certainly, I think that it's it's valuable to hear about the curriculum um, that the school offers, but I think that the focus of the, the discussion needs to be on the factors and criteria that the board needs to consider for its decision. I appreciate those remarks. And I'll, I'll say, guys, that uh, the Board of Adjustment is a little different than most other boards. We are It's quasi-judicial, so uh, you know uh, we have to take competent testimony on, on these review factors. I'll mention them to you in harmony with the area, not substantially injurious to the value of the properties in the general vicinity, in conformance with all two, uh, in conformance with all special requirements applicable to the use. Three, will not adversely affect the health or safety of the public. Four, will adequately address uh, uh, all of these, I guess, the review factors, circulation uh, being one of those as well. Um, so um, if, if, if we've got, um, I, I know that uh, uh, it seems like there's great support here, which is uh, I'm sure the applicant is, is very fond of. Uh, if, if you've got, if we can limit our, our testimony, just because uh, uh, we want to make sure we uh, have enough time to also hear from the experts and make sure we got all the questions asked, everything. But uh, Claire Dennis, would you like to take a? Yes, I'll be brief. So, so it's not to be repetitive, but um, I, I am a neighbor of Wildflower and also a parent of a child going to Wildflower. We walk to school unless I'm not brave enough to, to be in the 30 degree weather. We've never had an issue with traffic when we have been driving and 
I will just end with, I think it's really imperative that we throw our support around early childhood education centers such as this one. I think it could really be a different world if more children had access to this type of early educational experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, John Hill. Yeah, uh, just to speak uh, briefly, uh, I'm a parent and also um, uh, a neighbor. Um, I uh, to speak specifically to the traffic. Uh, I'm one of the many people that create the um, stroller traffic jam in the morning. Um, and I, I don't see and I've never experienced any sort of traffic related to um, cars themselves. It's only strollers. Um, I would say that um, it's one of the reasons that, you know, we continue to stay to we've made the decision to stay in Durham and not move um, to uh, back to Raleigh. Um, and my neighbor next door um, also has a 19 month old who's um, looking for um, daycares in the area to walk to. And we, um, you know, couldn't recommend Wildflower enough. Thank you. Uh, Joanna Jennings. Yes, good morning, thank you. Um, I am also speaking in support. Um, I wanted to just point out a couple of things. Uh, I'm an indigent defense attorney here in Durham, and so I put my lawyer hat on. Um, I did review the required findings as well as the review factors, and I also noted that the, the statute or the ordinance rather actually has the mandatory language of the this shall be approved um, if the evidence supports the required findings and review factors. Um, and so I, you know, urge the board absolutely based on based on my assessment, based on the planning department's report that um, this language is pretty unequivocal. Um, and I just want to point out that the program is simply moving next door. So I noticed, for example, um, when considering something like noise, um, there really will not be substantial difference to what's happening in the neighborhood. Um, I, uh, I know that a core value of Wildflower Cottage, and um, I'll say I sent all three of my children there, they're ages eight, five, and three. We've been attending since 2017. Um, a core value of the program is that the, we leave spaces better than we found them. And so I'll just note that Wildflower Cottage has a very light footprint. The teachers, the staff are just incredibly cognizant of their environment. Um, and so there won't be anything that will change the nature of the neighborhood. There won't be anything unseemly or anything that causes distress to the neighbors. Um, I just have the utmost confidence in Chrissy Snyder in this program. It's a nonprofit program. We're just incredibly fortunate to have this program here in Durham. Um, we have received so much um, from them. And I know um, that there have been some issues um, in, in front of this board in the past. And so I just want to be really just vo very vocal in my support um, and ask the, the board to approve the minor use permit. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll give uh, a couple minutes each as well to uh, uh, Cynthia Satterfield first and then Scott Anderson. Great, thank you. My name is Cynthia Satterfield. I live at 2412 Pickett Road next door to the Wildflower Cottage proposed property. Um, I've spoken with Cole Reniger uh, yesterday who's answered a lot of my questions and I've also spoken with representatives of the Wildflower Cottage some time ago. Uh, my primary concerns as a next door neighbor have been that the house be preserved, that the green space be preserved. This property is an anchor along this portion of Pickett Road. Um, and it's an important part of the fabric of the neighborhood. And though no historic designations apply to this property, I think they probably could. Um, I appreciate that the, um, that the Wildflower Cottage has, <clears throat> excuse me, found a creative uh, solution to meeting the parking requirements uh, by working with the church so that no more impervious surface is uh, added than is absolutely necessary. Um, and so overall, I believe that this project will best utilize the house and the property while adding a much needed service. It's very compatible with the neighborhood. And I think they'll be a good neighbor to myself and to the church. Um, I do wanna ask, especially since there's a focus in curriculum on um, wildlife, um, that in considering the addition of any uh, lighting for the project, that it be done so, I don't know if, the, if the, uh, the lighting was a requirement that was taken into consideration before or after the new um, LED street light was put in uh, in front of this uh, house, uh, but it pretty much, <clears throat> excuse me, daylights the property. Um, it's very, very bright. So we do have owls in the neighborhood and a lot of other wildlife. And I just wanna make sure that we don't add any more lighting that is absolutely necessary. 
Um, but that is all I wanted to contribute. Um, I speak in favor of the project. Thank you. Um, Scott Anderson. I, I just thought I should probably uh, speak up in favor. I am uh, the senior pastor at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, which has uh, been the landlord for Wildflower Cottage. Um, and we will be allowing them to use the parking space. And uh, I just wanted to let you know I'm here. So if somebody had any question, we've worked together with Chrissy now for about four years. Um, and in that time, we've been able to manage all the activities of the church as well as our preschool and her without causing any impact on traffic in the neighborhood. Um, we are certainly willing to continue to share. We share green space in the back and we will continue to allow the children to play in the green space in the back, which I think allows a very nice buffer for the whole neighborhood. And I just wanted to make sure you were aware that um, I'm here if somebody had any questions. Thank you, sir. All right, um, I appreciate everyone's testimony. Uh, Chris, help me identify if there is anyone here to speak in opposition to this. We had no registered oppositions, but if anyone in attendance can use the raise hand um, once again, if you are in opposition. All right, doesn't appear so. Um, is there a, um, a, Cole, would you like to give a, a, a recommendation? Yes, uh, staff recommends approval um, in accordance with everything that was submitted um, in the staff report and shown in the site plan. All right, let's bring it back to the board. Um, is there any discussion or um, anybody would like to make a motion? Mr. Tarrant. Um, yes, I just had a clarification for planning staff, please. Um, the, the parking agreement would in fact be a recorded instrument that would carry with the property, is that correct? That is correct, it is recorded and we have received that on file um, and have a copy of that and it was um, reviewed and approved. Um, okay, is that is that different than the letter from Mr. Anderson that's included in the application material? Um, I, I believe so, it's actually a more formal document, um, but we have received it and it has been um, reviewed and approved um as acceptable okay uh, my, my only concern was that this this particular letter indicates that it's revocable and will not run with the land and as it relates to approving a special use permit for required parking for this facility um i, I just had that one question so i appreciate right that. well it, it doesn't it doesn't run with the land it technically runs um with the use that's going there so if the use were to change in the future um they wouldn't automatically have access to the church parking understood thank you Meadows, can I follow up on that? Um, let's say for the sake of argument that um, for whatever reason, um, the parties to the agreement change or the agreement is no longer uh, desired to be honored. What would happen um, at that point? Um, at that time, I believe, um, I think it would it would carry but if, if it does end they would have to have provide some other form of parking to meet the requirement um i assume that it would be something that enforcement would handle from that point on um, that point forward or if if not um hopefully the applicant would contact us um but we, it would be something that uh would have to be um i guess found otherwise in other words they'd have to find some other way to accommodate parking whether it is coming back to the board to do more spaces or um, having some other shared agreement with another another surrounding area. Thank you. All right, any other discussion? Mr. Retchels. Yes, um, my question and concern is um, where do delivery trucks come and go? Where do they uh, drop off supplies. Uh, I'm sure you're going to be feeding the children and um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure as well the church has deliveries. Where, where, does, where does that happen at? And that's... So, um, what we actually do not provide catering. The children bring their own food. Um, so I think you would only be looking at things like the postal service or Amazon. Um, typically, I believe they enter in the picket road side of the church right now and drop off right there. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? 
I just wanted to chime in to say that I've, I've always admired this house. It's a beautiful house. And this is a very, very high use of the house because if it got into the hands of a developer, it would be turned into, and I know the church owns the property, but it would be turned into 10 not very cute houses. So to me, this is a fantastic way to have a good use in the neighborhood, keep the house on the planet, preserve the green space. And I'm, so I'm in support of this. Yep. All right. Well, um, if there's not any more, does anyone want to offer a motion? Wretchless here. Um, I, I would really like some more data on property values and, and, and it's something I could read um, to support surrounding property values, of course, but um, it, I mean, I'm really in support of this, but I, I, you know, there's review factors that we have to go over and, and that's just one that's uh, kind of um, preventing me from saying okay. We do have testimony from a, a licensed appraiser. Yeah, but I, I, I can see things a little more clearly when it's submitted and read about it. And um, that's where I'm at with it. Um, uh, Mr. Lacey? Are you okay? I think you're on mute. All right, I'm on mute. mute. Yeah, there we go. I'm trying to unmute. Thank you. Uh, we have a testimony from uh, a licensed um, appraiser, and we have anecdotal testimony from neighbors who are also uh, clients of, of this place, <clears throat> one of whom said the reason he's not moving back to Raleigh is because of this, uh, uh, this facility. Uh, Taken together, I think that's sufficient testimony to talk about uh, property values. Thank you. Good point. So noted. Good point. All right. Uh, okay, going back, uh, any... Uh, Mike, Tarrant? Yes, I, I think I would just like to reiterate what Mr. Kipp um, said, I, I think, you know, the fact that they're preserving, if I'm not mistaken, this house is almost 100 years old, if not more. Um, and I think that, you know, while it is a daycare, um, to me, that's certainly battle use for the area, um, given that it's adjacent to a church that has a preschool. Um, and I, I don't really feel that preserving the character and the footprint of the home um, to make this use happen is, is the right way forward. And, you know, even some of the more, um, the larger commercial daycares would, um, to, to Mr. Kipp's point, they would they would demolish the building and put up the facility that they feel is appropriate. So um, as far as being in harmony with the area, I, I feel like uh, this application certainly uh, does a good job of checking that box. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have to agree. I, uh, <clears throat> I know we are generally uh, used to seeing a, an appraisal report in our packets. Um, and, and sometimes those appraisers are on these meetings and give testimony as well. And sometimes they're not. We just have it in those uh, in our report. Um, having uh, Mr. Kirkland here today, <clears throat> uh, I think uh, satisfies that uh, for me uh, because he is the expert um, uh, while, while we're accustomed to having that report um, in, in probably more detail. Um, I, I think in, in my mind that uh, his testimony is sufficient, but I appreciate that. Any other thoughts or, or any, does anyone want to offer any kind of motion? This, this is Meadows and I want to share some of the um, frustration with this case. And the reason why I'm saying frustration is I think it's a fantastic use. I think it's a fantastic use of the property. I have a little kid and I know what it was like to have daycare and a home centered daycare is a great thing. Um, the best daycares we ever went to we're in refitted homes. Uh, so I get that. And I understand that. 
Um, I wish that this application had a little bit more thought applied to the relationship between the operations of the business and the, the, the various functional aspects that are necessary for a building that's got 10 employees and 45 kids. Um, if there's a fire, where do we go? Where do the trash cans sit? What's up with the lighting? How do we handle um, you know, ingress and egress from the parking? Those aspects, um, we talked about them, but anecdotally, and there's really not a ton of evidence about it. And, and so that makes this otherwise no brainer decision more difficult than it needed to be. Um, and I, and I, you know, I, I, I'm leaning towards supporting this, um, but I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm having some reservation about the, the functional aspects of the use. Maybe not necessarily with Ms. Snyder. I'm sure she's very good at what she does, but who knows who's going to be in this building operating this facility, you know, in two years or three years. Um, and will they be as conscientious and effective as Ms. Snyder? I don't know. And the site's not really well equipped to handle somebody who comes along who doesn't have that level of expertise. So uh, I just wanted to share those thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> As chair, I can make an exception to the rule. It sounds that we can accept a, uh, or I, <clears throat> excuse me, and clear my throat, uh, can accept uh, an appraisal report now um, uh, through the hearing if, if it wanted to. Um, and I don't see a reason why we wouldn't uh, for that, um, Mr. Kirkland's report, since it was not submitted on time uh, and ready for this meeting. So, uh, Brian, I don't know if you've got anything else to say. Um, Re Mike, Rachel's. Yeah, um, I think, is it Mr. Young, you're the architect? Um, have you considered uh, exit signs and things like that to kind of upgrade to, you know, um, a standard of egress in the building? Yeah, fire extinguishers in there and, and things like that. So by building code, we are required to bring the interior of this building right. up to the current standards to meet a daycare. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, just responding to your question, uh, I, I don't think it would be inappropriate uh, if, in fact, the applicant does have a report at this time uh, to share that with the board, if that's something that the board feels uh, would be necessary for its deliberations. I know typically we don't accept any um, evidence that was not pr provided in advance. Uh, in this case, uh, I think you have the, the ability to accept that there's uh, no opposition to this case. Um, and if it is something that the other board members think would really be helpful, I think you would have the ability as the chair to accept that at this point. Krista, you have uh, but, I, but I would I would ask uh, Krista to certainly weigh in on that uh, since this is a city case. Thanks, Krista. Um, Krista Cougar, City Attorney's Office. Um, I think uh, my my opinion at this point is that the board has heard testimony on property value. The report is not necessary um, to be included. Um, our practice during this nearly year of remote meetings, I think we got a late start on, on actually having remote meetings, has been to not accept um, anything, any um, written testimony uh, after the deadline and at the meeting. I think that that poses some challenges for the board considering that evidence in real time, written evidence in real time. Um, so I just, I think that that kind of historical practice is important to consider here. Um, and I think so far I've only heard Mr. Retchell say that he would like to see it. I think other board members have said they feel like the testimony that was given orally was sufficient. Um, my preference would be to, to not have that report included. Um, but at the end of the day, it's the board's decision to make. Yeah. I actually think that the testimony is sufficient. Yeah, and I just like to say, Rachel's here. Um, it's probably one of the 
the hardest review factors is the property values on a special use permit. And that's why I'm just trying to cross the T's. I think it's a great, um, it's the whole package is well done. And um, I am in support of it, um, but wasn't sure about physical evidence. Thank you, sir. I'll, sorry, I'll just add, I don't, I don't think, um, I don't think that the, the physical written evidence is a requirement. I think that that just has to be testimony and that can be written or oral. Um, I think that the board has received the oral testimony. And if you have questions, um, if you need to explore any of the aspects of the analysis further with Mr. Kirkland, you're more than welcome to do that. That's right. Uh, and I also like to remind, I mean, th this board shouldn't get into the enforcement. I mean, there, there's a whole department within, within the city and the county to deal with enforcing uh, uh, standards and, and, and regulations. So um, I know that often we have these questions. I think we have to also look at what's before us and it's this, uh, you know, this application for the uh, special use permit. So um, I don't, I wanna ask it uh, one more time. I don't know if anybody wants to make a motion. There's two things that can happen today. One, a continuous and two, a motion. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I had trouble pulling it up. Yes. I hereby make a motion that application number B2, whole bunch of zeros, 49, an application for a minor special use permit for a daycare in a residential district on property located at 2416 Pickett Road has successfully met the applicable requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and is hereby granted subject to the following conditions, that the improvements shall be substantially consistent with all the information submitted to the board as part of the application. All right, we've got a, a motion to approve by Ms. DeLacy. Is there a second? Second. Mike Tarrant is the second. Uh, Susan, would you call the board? Mr. Meadows? Yes. Mr. Kipp? Yes. Ms. DeLacy? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Tarrant? Yes. Mr. Retchless? Yes. Ms. Wymore? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. By a vote of seven to zero, your minor special use permit has been approved. We wish you the best of luck and thank you before, uh, for coming before the BOA this morning. Thank you. All right. Um, Susan, would you like to call the next case? Yes, B21000003, a request for a minor special use permit to construct an, to construct an addition onto an existing legal non-conforming single family dwelling. The subject site is located at 2310 Woodrow Street, zoned residential suburban and in the urban tier. This case has been advertised for the required period of time and property owners within 600 feet have been notified, notarized affidavits verifying the sign posting and the letter mailings are on file. The seating for this case will be Ms. DeLacy, Mr. Kipp, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Retchless, Ms. Wymore, and Mr. Tarrant. All right. Um, Cole, do you have this one? No, oh, Eliza. Hey, everybody. Um, and I believe that the applicant is already queued up and has his video showing Mr. Black. Um, so we'll just need to do the oath for him. All right, uh, Mr. Black, if you'll raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? I swear. And uh, do you consent to this remote meeting platform? I do. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Liza, take it away. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Eliza Monroe. I'm representing the planning department. Uh, planning staff requests that the staff report and all materials submitted at the public hearing to be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. So noted. Thank you. Thank you. Case B21000003 is a request for a minor special use permit to construct an addition onto an existing legal nonconforming single family dwelling. The applicant is John Black with Riverbank Construction, and the subject site is located at 2310, 2310 Woodrow Street. The case area is highlighted in red on the screen. The site is zoned Residential Suburban 8 or RS8 and is located within the urban tier. The site area is currently has a single family dwelling structure located on it, which you can see here in this aerial. 
The original building is an existing non-conforming structure as it does not conform to the current dimensional standards for the required side yard setbacks for a single family detached housing type um, per unified development ordinance section 7.1.2b. So you'll see here that the um, side yards require a minimum of nine feet and given that they're not able to meet that side yard on either side, this would be considered a non-conforming structure. The proposed reconstruction does not protrude past um, those sidelines, so there's no new encroachments being proposed. However, per UDO section 14.4.1c.4, additions to a non-conforming structure are permitted with a special use permit. Um, without a special use permit, so long as the encroachment does not increase more than 10% of the existing square footage, of the existing structure or increase the height. Um, the applicant is proposing 246 square feet of new floor area, which is a 25% increase over the original square footage, which would require a minor special use permit. Hence, while they're here before you all today. Um, additionally, the proposed scope of work does include a height increase over the original structure, original height of the home, um, which also requires a minor special use permit pursuant to UDO section 14.4.1C.5. Um, so therefore, they are here before you today, given that the height um, as well as the square footage has increased of a non-conforming structure. I would like to note that this structure is a part of the urban tier and therefore it would be required typically to meet the infill development standards, um, which we've mentioned before a couple of times in other hearings. I'll just note that the infill the standards um, have requirements about the height as it relates to this case. So per UDO section 6.8.3b, the maximum height of a structure shall be the maximum height permitted within the zoning district or no more than 14 feet taller than the height of any adjacent structure. Um, the maximum height permitted for a single family dwelling in the RS8 zone is 35 feet and the proposed addition is not more than 14 feet taller than any adjacent structure. So the height as it relates to those infill development standards is not an issue. Um, UDO section 3.14.8 establishes review factors and findings in which the applicant must meet in order for you all to grant a minor special use permit. Um, the application as well as all submitted materials were available within your packet as well as the staff report providing analysis and staff will be available for any questions as needed throughout the hearing process and staff of course will also continue to have control of the screen and change over things so that you can see different attachments. In addition to this original survey there are additional attachments that show the proposed addition and renovation from different elevations. Um, staff is now available for any questions. Thank you. Mr. Meadows, you got a question? Just two, thank you. Um, thanks, Eliza. Um, does this does this site have any uh, off street parking on it? That was the first question, and the second question is: as part of your review, um, did you notice if there are any other two story uh, buildings on this block face? Uh, did that did that come up at all? Thank you. So um, for the first question, technically there is off street parking in this front portion here. Um, there's also, in looking at the aerial, and I might ask Mr. Black to speak a little bit more because I just use Google Maps to see. And looking at the aerial, there looks like there might be um, an unofficial space, uh, not like a paved driveway, but area that's been compacted over time that might've had a cargo there in looking at the aerial. Um, but there is off street parking. Woodrow is a um, slightly narrow road, uh, but it looks like when I looked at an aerial, there was a car that was parked in front and there's that area behind a, tr a bush that looks like it had been compacted over time from a car parking there. Um, with regards to the height, the way the addition is, and I'm going to scroll a little bit to this image here. So this is the rear of the house where my cursor is pointing. So the way that we measure height, height um, for multiple roof levels shall be measured, determined by the highest roof level. And then when looking at the type of addition they have, we measure height from the midpoint within the city of Durham. So we go from the finished floor elevation. And when you have a gable type roof, it's the midpoint. Um, given that this addition in the rear is a flat roof, we would measure the height then from the finished floor elevation to this flat roof here. So it's a slight increase, a little bit shorter than the height of the chimney that's existing, um, but therefore it's not um, 
It is a second floor installation, but from the front of the property, it might not be very viewable. So therefore, in looking at the other adjacent homes, most of them are single family, single family probably with a little bit of attic space at the top. Um, but this is still within the purview of the urban tier standards of less than 14 feet taller than the adjacent structures. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> it, it does. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, very well done. Anyone else? Any questions for Eliza? All right, let's move on and hear from Mr. Black. John, I think you're still muted. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm with Riverbank Construction representing the homeowners here. Um, I believe you have everything in your packet. I don't want to necessarily repeat what you have before you, but um, we'll kind of reiterate what Ms. Monroe said that although the Height is technically increasing a little. It is um, the rear addition will remain below the primary gable of the house. So it's not something that's going to be very visible from the street and especially being set in from the sides of the house so much. Um, <clears throat> and then as far as the parking goes, um, it's exactly what she said. They don't have a driveway with gravel or, you know, um, pavement or anything like that. They tend to park on the street most of the time, but there is a place where you can pull up sort of in the front yard that's exactly been compacted um, that appears to be used as a driveway at times. Um, but we don't propose on any changes to anything like that. We don't propose many changes at all to a lot of the criteria that that's in the um, minor special use responses. You know, there's no change to the circulation on the site, the parking, the lighting, the use, the access, um, signage, utilities, none of this stuff is changing. It's, it's literally uh, just because we're adding on to this structure that's non-conforming on a non-conforming lot. And we would be, um, encroaching upon one of the side yard setbacks by about 15 inches. So with that, I will entertain any questions you all have. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> questions, for uh, Terrence. This is Terrence. Um, Mr. Black, I, I appreciate the, the summary. Um, am, am I correct in, in looking at this plan that you are not removing any of the large trees in the rear of the property to construct this addition? That is correct. And the, the footings of the, the, the addition won't affect the critical root zone of those trees? That is correct. We have, um, we've had Bartlett um, tree service on site already to inspect the health of these existing trees and to confirm that we are able to construct this as required uh, without affecting those trees because actually the addition does not extend any further into the backyard than the existing deck already does. <clears throat> Thank you. You're welcome. And any other questions for the applicant? Oh, Mr. Retches. Uh, hi, Mr. Black. Uh, it's a beautiful design. Um, Thank you. I just want to understand the peak, I mean, you're not going any higher than the existing peak of that gable, but it seems to flare out. So you're, is that what you're saying? That that's just a little bit higher on the, on the tapered uh, back of that cantilevered broom? It, it's a weird, it's a, yeah, it's I'm kind trying of to technical, like, it's kind of a kind of technical calculation as Miss Monroe pointed out the, the yeah. way they measure the heights of these things we're we're not the roof itself is not going to be higher than the peak of that, that primary gable but the interior space in the back of the house is going to be higher and the roof does slope up um, and the grade does slope down so there is an increase in height at the very back but again it, 
And, and I'll chime in a little bit about that too, Mr. Black, if that's okay. Um, sure. Eliza Monroe would stop speaking. The way we measure, measure heights is by roof type. So therefore, even though it's, we would consider them multiple levels. So therefore the gable, it would go to that midpoint, but because the addition is a different roof type, it's a flat roof, um, right. different height. So not, uh, I agree with you, it's a very small difference. Um, it really is just maybe a couple of inches more, but the gable height, since it's coming from that midpoint and then the back one is coming from the flat roof, technically they're different heights. Gotcha. Well, you've done a wonderful job in, in um, working that into the, um, that lot. It's, it's a nice, it's a nice picture. lot. <laughs> All right, any other questions for the applicant, Mr. Black? Eliza, do you have a, uh, or is there anyone uh, in the audience to speak in favor of this? Anyone else? Uh, right. Eliza Monroe speaking. There was no one else that registered for uh, this case to speak. Or, or in, a, in opposition either, right? Just Mr. Black was registered to speak for this case. Thank you. Um, Eliza, do you have a recommendation for us? I do also have a recommendation. Um, planning staff recommends the approval of case B21000003 such that the improvements shall be substantially consistent with the information and plans submitted to the board as part of the application. All right. Uh, any discussion? This is Meadows. I love it. Yeah, Rechless, I'm, I'm also for this uh, very well thought out and uh, it just doesn't impact. You can't even tell it's there. I, I, I share the same thoughts. Well, does anyone want to offer any other thoughts first? And then uh, if anybody wants to offer a motion, uh, please do so. I'd like to offer a motion. Mr. Rechless. I hereby make a motion the application number B21, lots of zeros three, an application for a minor special use permit on property located at 2310 Woodrow Street has successfully met the applicable requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and is hereby granted subject to the following conditions. <clears throat> the improvement shall be substantially consistent with the plans and all information submitted to the board as part of this application. We've got a motion for approval by Mr. Rechless. Is there a second? DeLacy. Got a second by Ms. DeLacy. Susan. Yes. Mr. Tarrant. Yes. Ms. Wymore. Yes. Mr. Rechless. Yes. Mr. Rogers. Yes. Mr. Meadows. Yes. Mr. Kip. Yes. Ms. DeLacy. Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. A uh, vote of seven to zero. Your minor special use permit has been approved. We, uh, you'll get an order soon. And uh, we appreciate you coming for the BOA this morning. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Uh, do I could call the next case or does anybody want a five or 10 minute break? Five minutes? Is that what I'm saying? Is that what we're saying 10, five, five. All right, we'll get five minutes. We'll reconvene at 9.57 then.
All right, as soon as Tisha and Ian come back, we'll uh, get started again. There's, all right, we're here. Uh, Susan, would you like to call the next case? Oh, yes. Okay, here I am. Uh, let's see, case B21000004. A request for a variance from the structured parking design standards and to exceed the maximum parking permitted. The subject site is located at 1417 West Pettigrew Street, zone compact design support one, and in the 9th Street compact neighborhood tier. This case has been advertised for the required period of time, and property owners within 600 feet have been notified notarized affidavits verifying the sign postings and letter mailings are on file. The seating for this case will be Ms. DeLacy, Mr. Kipp, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Retchless, Ms. Wymore, and Mr. Tarrant. All right. Uh, would everyone who plans on giving testimony for this particular case, would you please turn your video on? Um, Gosh, and uh, Preston Royster. The, the case number on his is different than what the one we're on. Does that matter? Preston is on three cases today. Oh, cool. Yeah, actually, I'm not on this one. Oh, it's let's move you back then. I think we got you ax by accident. Sorry. No, no problem. <laughs> um, Preston's a, a star. Uh, today. All right. Uh, if you plan on giving testimony, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give today will be the truth and nothing but the truth? I'll need a yes from each one. Linwood Smith? I do. Richard Grogan? Yes, I do. Yes. Yeah. All right. And do you each consent to this remote meeting platform? Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm Eliza? Yep, that's going to be me. Good morning again, everybody. Eliza Monroe representing the planning department. Uh, the planning staff requests that the staff report all materials submitted at the public hearing be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. Thank you, and so noted. Thank you. Case B21000004 is a request for a variance from the structured parking design standards and to exceed the maximum parking permitted. The applicant is Morningstar Law Group and the subject site is located at 1417 West Pettigrew Street. The case area is highlighted in red. The site is zoned Compact Design Support 1 or CDS1 and is in the 9th Street Compact Neighborhood Development Tier. Um, we haven't had, uh, the site is currently the location of a congregate living facility, and you can see it as an aerial here. Um, we're going to be kind of focusing on this portion of the site here in the corner, and there'll be some exhibits that will highlight that a little bit more. We haven't had um, this type of case in, in a while, or I'm not sure if uh, we've had one in this specific zoning district. So I kind of want to highlight the exact sections that we're going to be talking about. Um, so this might be a little bit longer presentation than normal, but it's just so that we're all on the same page. Um, so per section 10.3.1a of the Unified Development Ordinance, a congregate living facility is required to have one motor vehicle parking space per two units, in addition to one motor vehicle space per for every four employees. The use on the property consists of 137 care units and the maximum of and a maximum of 100, 147 on-site employees at any given time. This would require a minimum of 106 parking spaces on site. Within the CDS1 zoning district um, and within uh, 400 feet tier of the body, but with the 400 feet of the tier boundary, as the parcel is, parking can reduce to 80% of that minimum requirement by right and must not exceed 100% of the amount required per UDO section 10.3.1b.1. Therefore, the site currently has 104 parking spaces, but a total of 168 spaces is proposed. 
the UDO section 10.3.1b.1a can permit an applicant to exceed maximum parking if the following design standards are met. The parking must be provided within a structured parking and two of the three following standards must be met where at least 50% of the parking structure can um, is a structured roof area is a green roof. A minimum of 15% of the total parking provided shall be permanently publicly accessible and all street furnish portions of the parking structure shall be constructed to allow conversion to interior usable space. Additionally, within UDO section 16.3.2a, it states that parking shall not be exposed on the ground floor of a structured parking and must utilize a frontage type pursuant to UDO section 16.3.1. The ground floor frontage along a right of way shall only be used as other than parking. So this here, um, this request uh, to kind of summarize that, um, the applicants requesting a variance to exceed the max maximum parking permitted without meeting those two of three design standards that I mentioned from section 10.3. And they're also requesting a variance from section 16.3.2a due to the desire for the parking to be exclusively in this space where 16.3 would require them to have um, another use besides parking on that ground floor. I hope that was a good summary, but we can definitely talk about it a little bit more. Uh, so UDO section 3.14.8 establishes four findings that the applicant must make in order for the board to grant a variance. These findings requiring approval are identified in the staff report and the applicant's responses to the findings are identified in the application, both of which you received within your packet and staff is available for any questions throughout the process and will remain in control of the screen. Chad, I see a question. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, uh, I hope that was a good summary that we can all kind of understand the nature of the request that we're hearing this morning. Yeah, thank you for that, Eliza. Let's, Chad, you got a question? I do. It, it was a great summary, and I'm going to reiterate it so that um, I can um, display the fact that maybe I didn't understand it. So if I am wrong, please correct me. Okay. <clears throat> this site is um, in a special district, and you cannot exceed 100% of the maximum required parking spaces, uh, which is, I guess, about 106. Uh, they're proposing 68. And so in order to accommodate those additional 68, uh, however many spaces, 64, whatever it is, um, they need to do a structured parking, uh, a parking structure. Uh, that's pretty much the only way that this could, could happen. And when they do a parking structure, it needs to either have a 50% green roof or have 15 spaces available for public use or have, um, and this is the part I didn't understand, street frontage construction. I'm not sure what, what that meant. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. But so they want to go over. So they got to do structured parking. The structured parking has to have these, these elements, these configurations. It doesn't. And, and they also have to set up the ground floor of the parking garage, I assume adjacent to a street, so that uses other than parking are in that portion of the building. And they're, they're, they're wanting to not do that as well. Is that, is that right? That is right. So you actually understood and you're able to regurgitate well. So um, on the screen, you'll see to answer the question about street frontage. So Pettigrew and Powell Street, if you can envision uh, within the downtown area, you might know there's parking decks all through downtown, but most of them have uh, commercial or non-parking uses outward facing. So that's what we're talking about here. Those street frontage portions of the parking structure shall be converted, the first part, so that it should be converted, um, shall be constructed to allow the conversion to interior usable space. Section 16, which is our downtown design, um, that's our design district section that particularly deals with our downtown area. That um, blatantly states you have to have a use other than parking on the ground floor. Um, and in this case, the applicant, and I'll let them talk a little bit more about why they chose uh, this specific design, but in this case, the applicant is wanting to have uh, since they have an, a, a need for parking, they're wanting everything that they're to constructing, to constructing first floor, second floor, to all be parking, um, as opposed to having to, uh, one, have a space that's possibly able to be converted into another use that's not parking, um, or having to provide that frontage type as required by six, section 16 that states it cannot be parking on the ground floor. So Chad, you were on the money um, in terms of highlighting those different things. Thank you. 
Thanks, Eliza. And I'm hoping that the applicant will focus on those topics. I'm sure they will. Uh, any other questions for Eliza? I am accepting. I don't see any. Um, would the applicant like to come forward? I'm not sure which one of you would. I think it might be Mr. Ghosh. Right. Neil? Yes, and thank you, Ms. Monroe, for your presentation. Good morning, Chair Rogers, Vice Chair Meadows, and members of the Board of Adjustment. My name is Neil Ghosh. I'm an attorney at the Morningstar Law Group at 112 West Main Street in Durham. Today, I'm representing the applicant on its application for variances from certain provisions in the UDO. We also have Richard Grogan with RGG Architect and Linwood Smith, who's with the applicant group on the line as well. Uh, Mr. Chair, if now is the appropriate time, I would ask that all materials relied upon by the witnesses, including the staff report and all our application materials be entered into evidence and made a part of the record of this hearing. So noted, thank you, sir. So let me start first by acknowledging that this is a unique variance request. In a nutshell, we are requesting variances from provisions in the UDO related to parking. We are not asking for the ability to reduce parking below the minimum amount amount required. Instead, we seek to provide more on-site parking than is allowed on-site. Um, because the property is within a design district in a compact neighborhood tier, we also are seeking variances from various requirements for how parking can be developed. So why would we do this? Hillcrest has been part of the Durham community since 1951 and active at this location for over 50 years. As the forefront of senior care in the Triangle, Hillcrest strives to provide the best quality of life for its residents. This comes through not only uh, in the level of skilled nursing care residents can receive, but also comes down to the small things, elegant facilities, uh, regular cleaning and sanita sanitization, great food, private facilities, or group care settings. All of those things help provide that quality of life. Though often overlooked, Parking is another one of those items. Hillcrest is a victim of its own success. In addition to uh, patients visiting the site for regular treatment and the residents at Hillcrest, family and friends of Hillcrest residents also enjoy visiting the facility. Over the years, Hillcrest has seen a steady increase in its visitor and patient numbers. As a result, a parking issue has manifested. Uh, in the aerial photo we provided with the application, you can see a number of cars along Pettigrew Street. Those cars are stationary, they are not moving. Now, we cannot say that all those cars belong to folks visiting Hillcrest, but we do acknowledge that at least some do. At various portions uh, along Pettigrew, there is signage that prohibits parking. Regardless, it is clear that Pettigrew was not intended for street parking. There are no marked spaces, the street is quite narrow, we think the cars parked on both sides create an unsafe condition for motorists and pedestrians alike and make the street itself more difficult to navigate. Therefore, Hillcrest is seeking to make a significant investment to provide additional on-site parking, but it needs variances in order to do so. Before filing this application, we consulted with the planning department, including the planning director, to see if there were other options for us. Ultimately, we filed this request on the advice of the planning director. As with any variance, there are certain findings you all must make in order to grant the variance. So I wanna go through this. The simplest way for me to describe the hardship is that the use itself is allowed by right in the UDO. However, the limitations placed on parking restrict the amount of parking that can be provided on site to a number that is below the demonstrated demand for parking at this specific facility. In order to provide more on-site parking than otherwise is allowed, the UDO requires the use of structured parking. While structured parking is a significant cost to the owner, the applicant in this case does propose structured parking, but it cannot meet all the required design elements for structured parking contained in the UDO. For example, the UDO requires uses other than parking along the ground floor of parking structures. It envisions lobbies, offices, fitness rooms, or even retail along the street level of parking deck. Obviously, Hillcrest does not have a need for any of these things and desires only to build additional parking. Regardless of its desire, if you are familiar with the area, then you already know that this site is 
on the wrong side of the track, so to speak. The site is not in downtown proper. It is tucked in between 147 and the train track. There is very limited pedestrian level activity, if any at all. Uh, providing leasable space on the ground floor of the parking structure would serve no useful purpose to Hillcrest or the community. Without the variance, Hillcrest will be unable to provide additional on-site parking, which will allow an existing unsafe parking condition to persist. Primarily, the hardship is the result of changes to the UDO becoming applicable to a site that has been in existence for over 50 years. When the site was built, it never was envisioned as part of the downtown area and was meant to be a standalone convalescent center. It operated that way for many years until recently becoming part of the 9th Street Compact Neighborhood Tier and being zoned uh, Compact Design Support 1. With those changes, the additional design commitments became applicable to changes to the Hillcrest property despite Hillcrest's opposition to that rezoning. Uh, the hardship in this case is not the result of any action taken by the applicant. The rezoning of the property was a city-led initiative and one which Hillcrest publicly expressed its opposition. Moreover, the UDO allows businesses to develop without providing adequate on-site parking in this development here. And at the same time, the UDO prevents those same businesses from providing adequate on-site parking in a reasonable manner. Ultimately, this request is consistent with the spirit and intent of the ordinance. Unlike many variance requests, we actually do know what will happen here if the variance is not granted. Hillcrest will continue operating at its, as it currently is, and existing parking issues along Pettigrew will not be addressed at all. Instead, Hillcrest's efforts to try to address an existing issue, which is not at all required, which it, it is not at all required to address, should be lauded. The request is indicative of Hillcrest's commitment to its patients and residents and the Durham community as a whole. I doubt very seriously that you ever again will see an applicant proposing voluntarily to build structured parking when it is not otherwise required. Uh, as I said, we have our team available to answer questions um, and uh, we look forward to your vote today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ghosh. Are, are there any questions for the applicant? Ms. DeLacy. Yes, um, how long would, should this variance be granted? Um, how long would construction take and where would uh, people park in the, during that time? That's a great question. I think Richard on our team might be best uh, situated to answer that. Richard, if you could make yourself available. Yes, hello, this is Richard Grogan with RGG Architects. Uh, that question came up uh, within their inner circle as well. And what we're hoping is that uh, some of the uh, apartment buildings and other uh, retail concerns uh, in the Ninth Street area um, would be able to entertain some parking. And we would probably have to bus back and forth between Hillcrest and those properties. Delacy, have you have you talked to any of the? I'm sorry, uh, have you talked to anybody? Are you in negotiations with uh, borrowing parking spaces, or are you just hoping? We have not gotten to that point yet. Um, um, so we have not. Um, and how long will the construction uh, process take? Uh, probably nine nine months or so. I suggest, sir, that you kind of start talking to people. Yeah, well, <laughs> and again, that uh, uh, this is in, in, in the planning phase still. So uh, when I say nine months, um, oh uh, we this would be a precast structure. Um, a lot of that precast would be made off site. Um, so when I say nine months, maybe the time for disturbance is going to be minimized. But uh, could be as, as little as three or four months actual disturbance on site. All right, uh, Chad, you've got a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Ghosh. Thanks for, for uh, going through that. I uh, appreciate that. Um, as I understand it and staff jump in if I'm wrong, there are two variances at hand here. 
Uh, the first is if you do a structured parking, you must do two of the, the th meet two of the three required criteria the green roof, the parking spaces available for public use, or the, the configuration to allow conversion of ground floor area to a separate use other than parking. That's one. Then the other one is the utilizing the frontage type, having some other kind of business or use type along the ground floor of the, of the, um, of the garage. Uh, so my question is, uh, Mr. Ghosh, did you talk at all about the first variance, which is the the green roof or the public spaces or the the ground floor recon, uh, alternative configuration? D did you talk at all about that? Uh, and if you didn't, would you please now? Sure, and I guess I could speak specifically to those items. Um, for, so this structure would be, it's called a tabletop uh, parking deck. Um, when you consider a parking deck, uh, that would that would have, for example, a green roof. Uh, typically, that parking deck would be multiple stories. The roof of that structure would be, you know, the top of the building here. Uh, the way this thing is going to be built or has been designed, uh, yeah, and this is a great photo that's up here. Uh, you can see the roof of the parking structure is really the essentially the surface level of the facility, or it's actually a little bit below it. So a green roof is not something that really could be accommodated on this uh, design. If this were a taller parking structure, you could have a green roof on top, uh, but this is essentially the, the roof of this parking structure is the same level as the surface par existing surface parking uh, up towards the facility. A green roof would not be uh, possible here. As far as, um, so, and then the, one of the three items is providing spaces which are providing area which could be converted to um you know a use other than parking that is the, we addressed that when we were talking about the uh, second variance which is that we really can't accommodate a pedestrian level uh use here um they go hand in hand i mean uh, if this were not in a compact uh, neighborhood tier or design district, a parking structure would be required, for example, to provide space which could be converted. Uh, however, because it's in a compact neighborhood tier um, or design district, the requirement under the UDO is that they actually utilize that space for um, something other than parking. And that I believe we did address that earlier. So we won't be able to meet the requirement for two of the three and therefore are requesting a variance in that section. Th thank you, quick follow up. Um, you said that you couldn't do a green roof because a taller, uh, you'd need a taller structure to do a green roof. Um, is there anything stopping, are there any regulations that are impeding the ability to make this a, a taller structure so a green roof could be accommodated? So I, I just, I suppose a taller structure is not envisioned here because the, if the parking deck were taller, it would be, it would start to impede on the building itself. So this is just, this is essentially a adding another level of parking above the surface, existing surface level parking. Um, if we were to go with the taller structure, which is not what is proposed here, um, it, that, that structure would actually impede the building. We wouldn't be able to see the building. Okay. And one more, uh, one more question, please, sir. Um, to the, to the second variance, which is the design district requirement that triggers the fact that you must have, uh, you know, a ground floor um, alternative use. Um, I, is, I guess I'm trying to understand the hardship here. Um, the, the hardship is we don't wanna have ground floor uses because we can't, or we don't want to have ground floor uses because we don't want to. No, I think the hardship here is really, and when I see Richard has it been, I think the hardship here really is uh, kind of twofold. One, there's an existing parking issue here. There, that that's the hardship. We can't add parking spaces to the site without providing uh, uh, structured parking. That's that's the way the UDO works. So if we have to do structured parking, the way it works under the ordinance is that there would be we would be required to have 
a use other than uh, parking on the ground floor of that. Hillcrest does not have any need for that. Hillcrest is only trying to provide parking. They have all of their, um, you know, office space, leasing space, whatever is already in the existing building. The the if there were uh, non-parking uses provided along the ground level of a parking deck at this location, those uses would have minimal uh, pedestrian level activity, if any at all. This is right next to the train track we're talking about. Uh, this is not a location where retail would be interested in going. I'm gonna let Richard on our team also address this question as he has hand up. Yeah, thanks. Now, uh, so the intent with the design was to make this as low impact as possible. Uh, from a visual standpoint, it, it really, you know, this is a terrace, it's not a parking deck. Uh, in our opinion, the the current upper parking that Hillcrest has now will be extended over the upper level of the terrace. Uh, there is no communicating ramp between the two levels. Uh, you access the lower level from from Post Street, and you access the upper level from the existing parking drive uh, that Hillcrest uh, has at their uh, facility. Um, we looked at well, because of, of the low impact, we're tucking it into the bank uh, a gray level of the upper level of, of the building. Uh, ventilation becomes a problem. Excuse that. <laughs> ventilation becomes a problem with, uh, we have to have cross ventilation within the deck. So if we were to do the 20 foot retail establishment around the perimeter of the, of the exterior, we would lose the chance to ventilate the deck uh, without some kind of very complicated uh, mechanical system, which I don't even think we would still have enough surface area to, to bring the air through the through the lower level. Uh, an occupied space uh, along that perimeter would also require an infrastructure, mechanical systems, electrical systems, all things that uh, if you have a multi-story deck, it works, but this is a terrace. It's, it's meant to be a low impact parking feature that you really don't know is there. In fact, it would be a much more attractive feature than what you see on the photograph currently. All right, we've got uh, Mike Tarrant. Yes, so I, I, I think I generally understand the hardship in, in and the, the need for the request. What, I, what I'm really wrestling with is um, how this is really consistent with the spirit, purpose, and intent of the UDM. Um, I, you know, just looking at the images provided, I see a, um, a standard sort of typical precast parking deck with, with no other public spaces, walkways, um, you know, no additional screening that might suggest you're, you're attempting architecturally to address some of the front requirements and so forth. Do you um, speak to me a little bit about uh, about those um, those review criteria? Sure. And in in, in our uh, in our estimation, this request is consistent with the spirit, purpose, and intent of the UDO. In I'm going to just throw a number out there. We'll see if I get to that number, but like in three ways. Um, so the first is so the picture that's up here is is uh, is informative. So what you're seeing here is, is inconsistent with the spirit, purpose, and intent of the UDO. This is exactly the issue that we're trying to address by providing more on-site parking. Um, the other thing to consider, which is contained in the comprehensive plan and therefore is incorporated in the UDO, is that the, the comprehensive plan envisions a, a allowing or supporting existing businesses in their expansion. Now, I wanna be clear. Hillcrest is not adding more rooms or anything. Their expansion in this case is the result of their continued uh, uh, success in, in, in the high quality of care that they've provided to residents of the Triangle for you know, more than 50 years. So they're having more people come to the site. They don't have more residents on the site. They're not adding any bedrooms. They just have a need for more parking on the site in order to make it safe for everyone. Not only the people who visit their site, but the people who might otherwise drive past this area. So by, by being able to provide more on-site parking, um, 
and, and therefore make a paper uh, condition on the road, I would, I would say that is one consistent from a safety standpoint with spirit, purpose, and intent of the ordinance, and also is consistent with the comprehensive plan and that it allows an existing business to uh, continue to thrive in this area. And I guess I didn't get to three, but I will say a third thing that I wanted to note is one of the, you know, and Richard touched on this, one of the problems with providing a retail space or what, you know, a non-parking space along the frontage of this site is that that use also itself would require parking. And that's kind of the whole issue. We can't, we can't fit more parking. We're trying to fit as much parking as we can on the site to address an existing issue. The site is totally, right now, it's totally compliant with the UDF. So without the variance, Hillcrest can continue to operate. You're just going to get more of this, uh, the picture you're seeing on the, uh, on the page here. So hopefully that addresses your question. Mike, you have anything else? Uh, I think I'm, I'm fine for now. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Look through here. I don't see anyone. Um, Eliza, will you uh, stop sharing? Yeah, the I was going to say, yeah, stop sharing. I think we're at the point now when no one needs a copy of it. All right. Uh, any discussion? Mr. Lacey? Um, just from a personal standpoint, my uh, my mother and my mother my mother in law has been a guest of Hillcrest on a number of occasions, and uh, my mother in law is there now. Um, parking has been a real significant issue, um, the, and the front of Hillcrest faces the uh, uh, the railroad tracks, and there is no even though it's part of the downtown by uh, downtown tier, it, it, is, it is landlocked by 147. I think they that originally Hillcrest owned land right across 147 and had to give that up when they built the highway. Um, but there's, there's no, uh, parking can be difficult. You can wind up having to go to Whole Foods and, sneak over the over the railroad tracks or park up and down uh, Pettigrew Street. Um, and it's truly an issue. Uh, and it's it's unique place, a physical location doesn't fit into what I believe was the idea of, of the change of the UDO. Uh, so I think they've they're trying to have a good solution to uh, the problem of their popularity. Uh, that's all I got. Thank you for those comments. Uh, Mr. Meadows. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I um, So the bottom line for me on this one is I haven't really seen any evidence why the design can't be met, the design requirements can't be met, except that the applicant simply doesn't want to. Um, and the hardship is that the design, complying with the design requirements would be either too expensive or provide something the applicant doesn't need. Um, as far as I can tell, they meet the minimum parking requirement, they wish to add more parking spaces. As I understand the UDO requirements, the, the the condition of adding more parking spaces is complying with the design requirements for how that parking needs to be configured. Um, and the variance request is to avoid that uh, because it's not desired. Um, so that's my, my point of view. Um, I'm not sure that I feel like the burden of evidence has been carried. I wanted to ask a question for staff um, and that is whether or not an application for a rezoning to remove the design requirement has been uh, filed or discussed up to this point for the, for this property. Uh, Elias Monroe Planning Department, not that I'm aware of. I have, am not aware of a rezoning request to remove the design district um, designation from uh, this site. And I might also ask Jessica Dockery to chime in because I'm not sure of the feasibility of that. That was a larger scale project in which a very vast portion of Durham, um, well, all of Durham was designated into specific tiers. 
Um, so I am not sure of the feasibility to change that over. So I might ask Jessica if she knows any further um, to provide some details. But at this time, staff has not received any applications or is not aware of any applications to rezone, to remove that designation of the design tier. Uh, Jessica, do you have anything? This is Jessica Dockery, Planning Department. Um, there are always mechanisms to explore that option, but I'm not confident that it would be looked with favor on, but that of course is not planning department's determination that would have to go to city council. Well, and I would, it uh, sounds like from the testimony we've heard that this property was uh, rezoned uh, against the wishes of the property owner, um, which is uh, interesting and, and makes me, you know, ask the question, you know, was, was the hardship created when those, when that change was made and uh, to the, and, and has now different standards when sounds like this building was first was built in 1951. Uh, Neil, you may, you may need to uh, uh, correct me on that if I was wrong, but uh, you have your hand up. Do you have, would you like to address something? Yes, uh, absolutely. So I did want to say, as I said earlier, we did consult with the planning department about this um, and we did discuss rezoning uh, and it was in no uncertain terms, uh, the, the planning department would not be able to support an application for rezoning um, from the, uh, the CDS1 district, because that is uh, this, based on the tier uh, makeup, that is the district that would be consistent with the comprehensive plan uh, and, and tier designation. Um, so there isn't another zoning district that would be consistent. Um, and and uh, Chair Rogers, Hillcrest has been in operation since 1951 in North Carolina. At this location specifically, I don't, I don't know when this building was built. I don't know if Hillcrest built this building. I, my, uh, my understanding is that the building was, was, was built sometime after 1951, but Hillcrest has been in operation in Durham uh, since 1951. Okay. All right, uh, any other discussion? Can I just chime in? And um, Regina had said this, uh, Ms. DeLacy had said this previously. It's a very strange site. It's wedged between the railroad. There's one egress and, ac and exit, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it really is a suburban site. Um, so I'm not a big fan of making parking, but this is a pretty unobtrusive way to do it. And there, there is a definite parking need. Um, if you try to cross the tracks there, um, right, it's sort of right at Broad Street, Whole Foods is on the left, East Campus is on the right. It's a mess. It's a total mess. So I don't, uh, I think this makes sense. Um, I don't think that, I think the factors are met and I'll just leave it there. I have to agree with Ian and Regina on the fact that this is a, a very peculiar location given between a, a major railroad track and an interstate. Uh, and Pettigrew is, is um, uh, a narrow road. I mean, I, I've, I've visited this site uh, before this, you know, in preparation for this, uh, of course, but I'm also very familiar with the area. Um, but I, I actually have to agree with the applicant when he says that the intent and, and, and purpose of the ordinance is I don't think it would be all of this parking, street parking on on Pettigrew and the way, you know, that picture kind of uh, says a thousand words, if you will, uh, on, you know, I, I don't think that serves a purpose. I also think about, uh, uh, you know, for what it's worth, in my opinion, um, having, you know, putting retail on that corner of, of the road in Pettigrew uh, or, or, or whatever kind of use down there, uh, one, it, that would require additional parking. So um, maybe that would be another uh, level to that parking uh, deck. And, and so it's even more uh, needed. Um, and also it's like, I don't, I don't, where's the market uh, for something for, you know, uh, for a use down an alley, essentially. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know if that's a, 
uh, a, a good use uh, of of that space. But uh, I'm in I'm in support of, of this variance. Um, I think it seems to me that uh, I don't I don't I don't see how the, the the applicant hasn't created this hardship for themselves. Any other thoughts? All right, well, we, this is a variance request and does not get a staff recommendation. I don't know if anyone wants to offer a motion or offer additional thoughts. And if you're not satisfied, I, I think now is the time to, to, to speak up as well. I'm sorry, Mike. Sorry, I was just going to offer to make a motion. Um, I hereby make a motion that application number B210004, a request for a variance from the structured parking design standards and to exceed the maximum parking permitted on property located at 1417 West Pettigrew Street has successfully met the applicable requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and here is hereby granted subject to the following conditions. The improvements shall be substantially consistent with the plans and all information submitted to the board as part of the application. We have a motion to approve uh, by uh, Mike Tarrant. Is there a second? Kip second. Uh, second by Ian Kip. Uh, Susan, would you call the board? Mr. Regulus? No. Ms. DeLacy? Yes. Mr. Meadows? No. Mr. Kip? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Ms. Wymore? No. Mr. Tarrant? Yes. Motion carries five to two. Four to three. Four, four to three. What is the vote count needed on, on this, Crystal? Motion failed. You gotta have five. That's correct. I've got DeLacy, Kip, Rogers, Retchless, and Tarrant voting yes. The uh, Retchless was no. Yep. All right. Well, we, all right. Well, motion fails four to three. Um, I'm tempted to ask the people who voted no the reasons. Uh, I don't, I, uh, Tisha, you didn't give uh, a reason on, on thoughts when asked. Uh, Mike, I don't know if you did either on this. Uh, do you want to share them now? I can. I, I just don't seem that um, that there was enough, uh, the hardship was created from conditions peculiar. As a board member here, we're or to weigh that evidence. And I just don't think, um, you know, there's a lot of gray areas here too. Don't get me wrong. Um, I think on a safety uh, of the area and the property, public safety that is, um, yes. But uh, we're here to, um, you know, weigh those hardship results. And I, I just don't, I think, um, because Hillcrest doesn't have a need for structured parking weighs more toward a self-created hardship. That makes sense. I, uh, DeLacy, Mike, I think it has to do with what you consider need. Uh, it's very clear that there are more people who are going to this facility than be, can be accommodated for. So although there are standards that there's supposed to be one space for every four um, uh, uh, rooms, I think it was, um, there are more people that come there and more people that park along Pettigrew and sneak into the, the parking uh, facilities uh, up and down the street. Um, and there are, uh, then there are spaces for them. And, you know, it's, it's not just about the, uh, the ordinance, it's about what the need is for parking. Uh, and I think that 
it's been adequately demonstrated that you know traffic and safety are significantly impacted by this continuing uh, problem, uh, and this is their solution. Uh, yeah, and I don't even know if this is an appropriate conversation because this should have been happening in deliberations uh, when we have this. Um, you know, and I, I'm, I think from now on, I'll just ask every board member to have a, a comment and, and indicate how you plan on voting or how you can support or not support, because uh, I guess we'll just move on from this. Because um, we also need this for the record itself uh, and, and discussion has to happen uh, for the record for when cases, if they do go to, are appealed for whatever reason. Uh, I think it is uh, incumbent upon us to uh, give thoughts on on uh, why we support or why we don't uh, every time as well. Uh, Chad, do you have something before we move forward? Um, I, no, Mr. Chair, let, let, let's just move on. Good deal. Uh, Susan, would you call the next case? Case B21000005 a request for a variance from the sidewalk requirements. The subject site is located at 3912 Rivermont Road, zone PDR 1.964 in the EB watershed protection overlay and in the suburban tier. This case has been advertised for the required period of time and property owners within 600 feet have been notified Notarized affidavits verifying the signposting and letter mailings are on file. The seating for this case is Ms. DeLacy, Mr. Kipp, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Retchless, Ms. Wymore, and Mr. Tarrant. All right. Um, I think, have we got everybody on camera here? Just want to make sure. Um, if you plan on giving testimony today, would you please raise your right hand? Uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? I'll need a verbal yes or, uh, from everyone. Yes. Uh, Danielle Brestel? Yes. All right, that came from Julie. Uh, and Danielle? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I got you on mute. Still on yes. mute. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. And also, do you consent to this remote meeting platform? Need a yes. yes from everyone. Uh, Danielle? Yes. And Julie Olson? Yes. All right, um, thank you. Is that all? I think that's everyone. Uh, staff want to chime in really quickly. For the record, to the second individual on um, the Olson screen, are they also going to speak? Because we would need their name for the record if they anticipate speaking. I was just uh, going to ask that. Uh, it's Charles Cozart. Are, are, you, uh, are you planning on speaking as well, Mr. Cozart? He might. I might. All right, well then, uh, I don't know. Did, did you take the oath? Because I didn't. I don't think we heard you. I'm oh, going to take, you the oath. Uh, take the oath as well. Uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. And uh, do you consent to this remote meeting platform? Yes. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, we've got, I think we've got his name on here now. Um, Cole, is this yours? It is. Take it over. It is mine. Okay. Good morning again. I'm Cole Nigger representing the Planning Department. Mm -hmm. Planning staff request that the staff report and all materials submitted to the public hearing to be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. So noted, thank you. Um, case B 20000 is a request for a variance from the sidewalk requirements. <clears throat> the case area is highlighted in red. Um, the site is in the suburban tier zoned planned development residential PDR and is within the city of Durham jurisdiction. Um, Daniel Brestel on, half, um, on behalf of the owner of Weaving Water LLC requests a variance from the requirement that sidewalk be placed on both sides of the street. The site is on planned development residential PDR and is in within the suburban development tier. Per Unified Development Ordinance UDO Section 12.4.2C, required sidewalk along the right of way of the development site shall be provided as applicable per paragraph 12.4.2A through one of the following two methods payment in lieu or combination of, um, or sorry, or construction of a sidewalk within the right of way 
Um, they want to provide an additional sidewalk across Riverwood Road instead of doing a payment in lieu. They are not able to meet sidewalk um, within the right of way uh, because of um, preserved trees. Um, staff would like to mention that on the site plan currently there is a payment in lieu that they have um, as a special condition of approval. Um, so that is one of the options that they are ignoring um, that, in other words, is um, they would have to prove that the site meets different standards that are applicable to be exempt from the payment in lieu option. Um, however, financial, um, financial reasons cannot be a reason for hardship. Um, so we ask the board to take that into consideration when they are um, voting on the case. Um, Pre-DO section 3.14 establishes the findings listed below that the Board of Adjustment may make in grading and variance. These findings and more on these, fi these findings and review factors are identified in the staff report and the applicant's response to the findings. Um, the staff will be available for any questions at the end um, during the meeting. Thank you, Cole. Uh, any questions for Cole? Uh, look, uh, Chad. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Cole. Thank you for that. I have a question. I, I'm still, I'm a little confused. Is this a variance from the sidewalk requirements or is, are they really kind of seeking a variance from a payment in lieu that's part of an approval on the record? So they're, the, um, they're requesting a variance from the sidewalk requirements um, in order to, I would assume, avoid the, uh, the payment in lieu because payment in lieu is an approvable option that they have um, the choice to do. Um, but when making that, like I said, again, when making that um, decision, make sure that you take into the financial hardships cannot be part of the, uh, the hardship case. I'm, I'm sorry. Is the payment in lieu required or is it optional? The payment in lieu is one of the, so when you're doing sidewalks, the payment in lieu is an option or adding sidewalks to both sides. Um, those are the options that are allowed by the UDO. One or the other. Okay. Right. And they're putting in a sidewalk, but not on both sides. That's, that's correct. Um, the sidewalk right now is just on one side um, because of the trees that they have they're preserving um i'll pull up the i'll pull up the site plan um to kind of show you that but so their variance is to put a to, they're seeking a variance from the sidewalk requirements because they only want to put the sidewalk on one side instead of both correct and i'll, I'll let the applicant speak more um in detail about what they're trying to do um because i don't want to i don't want to speak on their behalf of trying to um you know prove their case valid Indeed. or not. i'm just trying to understand what what they're asking thank you right Uh, Mr. Terrence got his hand raised. Yeah, so just a question for planning staff as far as what what's driving the requirement for sidewalk on both sides of the street. Typically, it's, you know, it would be required along the frontage of your property. Um, is it the, the width of the right of way or the, the type of street section it is? I was looking for clarification it's, it's, on that. It's, um, it's there's streets that are defined that require both sidewalks on one side versus two sides. Um, I think a couple of years ago, the UDO was, or recently the UDO was updated. Some streets do apply just one, but some do apply to both sides of the street. But it is a UDO best. Um, All right, any uh, other questions for Cole? And uh, I, saw, I saw that in the chat, there was a question to um, zoom in and I'm going to do that. I'm just pulling up, uh, I can't zoom in on the actual presentation. So I'm gonna pull up the site plan so I can view in on that, such, that um, section for one of the staff members. All righty, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, if there are no other questions for Cole, we'll, we'll move on to hear from the applicant. Great, thank you. And I do have a presentation, I'm, I'm sorry, I do have a presentation that I'm gonna show. Um, can we allow a couple minutes just so Ms. Wymore can look at this before I move on to the applicant's presentation? I think that is appropriate, okay. Uh, Ms. Brest will give us a few moments. Sure.
Hey, Cole, it's okay if you're just waiting on me. I can look okay. at my own packet. I mean, you know. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, I'm going to share the applications presentation now. All righty. Um, um... Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Danielle Brestel with Weaving Water. LLC, we are uh, developing a co-housing community on this parcel. Um, when we rezoned the parcel in order to provide parking um, kind of on the outside of the property is done in off, often done in co-housing, we did so in 2018, at which time, as Mike mentioned, there was only a sidewalk requirement for one side of the street. And since then, there has been an additional requirement where sidewalks are needed on both sides. Um, at that time, Planning Commissioner Tom Miller requested that we preserve the evergreen buffer next to our parking lot between River Mount Road and our parking so that the neighbors wouldn't see our parking lot, it would block some of the light pollution, et cetera. So, um, Basically, when we look at what the zoning ordinance or what the ordinance is now for having sidewalks on both sides of the street, there are three options for uh, doing a sidewalk. You can either have it in the right of way, which conflicts with our evergreen buffer preservation that we've committed to. You can have it internal to your site, which the, our civil engineer Luke Perkins will speak to in a little bit about the difficulty of us doing that on our site. And then the, all, the last option is to do a payment in lieu of. Now, if we can look at the first slide of the presentation, it'll show uh, an aerial view of the area. Is it possible to make the screen, maximize the screen on that? I can I can zoom in and zoom out, but I cannot uh, maximize any bigger than yeah. Make it in presentation mode or something. Okay, so I've color coded the sidewalks that are uh, proposed here. So the weaving water parcel has um, the property lines are all shown in white, and we would come out of our property with the the red line that's on the east side of Rivermont Road. I, I'm sorry we'll to stop. I can actually stop sharing. Chris Peterson has offered a share where this is bigger. Would you be okay, okay. to that change? That's fine. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> so essentially we would come um, out of our property where the red sidewalk line is on the east side of Rivermont Road. We would come down to uh, a crosswalk across from Grayley Drive right there. And then there's an existing sidewalk that is in, shown in yellow. Then if you head to the north along the yellow sidewalk, we come to an area where we need to install the sidewalk in order to lengthen it to the edge of our property line, which is shown in white. So we would lengthen that sidewalk to the center of the property at 3915 Rivermont. Well, when we realized that we would have a sidewalk that sort of dead ended in the middle of their property, we asked uh, the people who live at 3915 Rivermont, which is um, Julie and Charles, uh, who are on the call today, if they would like to extend that sidewalk further. And so that's what we're asking for is instead of doing the in lieu of payment is doing additional sidewalk length to connect it to the state park. So what you'll see here is that the property to the north of us is a conservation easement that we own and we entered into with Eno River State Park. So that's all preserved land. And then on the left side and the north of uh, Rivermont Road is the state park. So Eno River State Park. And you'll see the star there shows the pump station trailhead. And so we would like to be able to connect that sidewalk all the way to the state park boundary so that people in the neighborhood can can walk through and that the uh, Julie and Charles won't have a stop right in the middle of their property where the sidewalk would end. Um, if you go down to the next slide, you'll see a view from the street. So again, I've shown in red where we are required to put the sidewalk. 
this is their front area. And then the blue is showing what we propose to do if this sidewalk uh, variance is accepted or passed, we would extend that sidewalk to the edge of the state park. If you go to the next si uh, slide, we also spoke to the neighbors to the south. And so this would show where the yellow sidewalk goes is already in existence. And then we also talked to the neighbors at 3801 and 3721 Rivermont to see if they would like to have a sidewalk extend onto their property. And they did not express any interest in that. So I didn't want to go building a sidewalk in someone's front, front yard um, without their permission, but that was something they were not interested in. So that it concludes my portion um, of the presentation. And I think Luke Perkins would like to speak to the hardship of building uh, a sidewalk on the, the site in board of the right of way. Yeah, so essentially the hardship that we're running into from an engineering and design perspective is along the right of way, we have trees that need to be maintained based on conditions of the zoning. Um, Can you and then move if to you, the next slide too? It'll show our site plan. There we go. And then once the sidewalk leaves the, the right of way and is on our site, it has to meet the requirements of ADA. So basically it has to be 5% or you have to have ADA ramps. Um, and the hardship that that's gonna create for us is basically the design intent of the site. This will be this, I think, the, only the second project that's approved in Durham as a low impact design project from a stormwater perspective. Um, a lot of people throw around the low impact design uh, kind of nomenclature as they attempt to have a project that has a lower impact design, but we actually are meeting the state required guidelines for a low impact design project. Um, the hardship that would be created by having a, a sidewalk on our site that has to have ADA compliance across the frontage is it would undoubtedly create more impervious area and it would um, have us impact more of the area that we are planning on having tree save um, and could throw us out of our low impact design um, category. Um, I think, you know, with, without walls um, that would have to come on, on part of the design for the sidewalk to meet ADA, um, it would change the grade of the site significantly um, and would essentially affect a lot of the trees that we are currently saving. Danielle's put a lot of thought into the layout of this site where we are, uh, there's a lot, there's mature trees on site that are kind of internal to the, the looped driveway. Um, so the, the design intent here was to create a site that really maintained the character of the kind of natural area and its surroundings. Um, and unfortunately, having to grade a sidewalk internal to the site that meets ADA would throw a lot of that original design intent out the window and have us design the site to meet that specific constraint. Um, so that's the hardship that we're running into beyond the obvious uh, hardship of not being able to, to install the sidewalk along the right of way to maintain the trees that were you know, part of a requirement as um, the zoning zoning condition. That's all I have, unless there are any questions. And I think um, Julie and Charles wanted to also speak on their, uh, regarding the, the sidewalk on their property. All right, uh, Julie, Charles? Yeah, um, having a sidewalk just go to the middle of our property is just kind of weird. So having it extend all the way to the to the edge, you know, all the way across the front would be ideal for us. All right, and and um, uh, Julie, wh where do you live? Uh, At thirty nine fifteen Rivermont. Okay, thank you, um, Mike. I saw your hand first. Um, you got a question? 
Yeah, so just had a couple of clarifications. One, one, we're not talking about sidewalk on private property, correct? I mean, it, it'll all be within the right of way. We're just talking about continuing it up along the frontage of your property. Is that correct, Ms. Olson? Yeah, just the right of way. Okay. Uh, the, the second question, I don't know if this is for, uh, for Mr. Perkins or, or Danielle, um, but I, I, don't, I don't fully understand um, protection of the trees, right? You've got a public right of way. So by right, um, you know, city or state could come in and construct that sidewalk. They could put in utilities, they could do other things. So I don't, I don't understand how not constructing the sidewalk along the frontage of your property will or will not affect the, the tree buffers, um, the protected trees. I mean, I, I understand where you're coming from, but there's no way that you can protect it. So, you know, I feel like there should have been additional measures in place to protect those trees if it was part of a zoning condition. Um, well, I mean, all I can say is that the, when the zoning commitment was made, there was only a requirement to have the sidewalk on one side. So we expected to have it on the opposite side of the street. Um, and then if we, were to allow the sidewalk to go in, we would be conflicting with this commitment because you would have to take down the evergreens to put it in the, in the right of way. Um, the, the average distance of the tree trunk from the edge of Rivermont is 14 feet. Some of them are 10 feet and we would severely be impacting the root zone and uh, trimming all of the branches in order to attempt to put in a sidewalk in the limited space. Most of those branches come all the way to the edge of the street. Uh, Mr. Meadows, you have a question. I do, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I, I feel like I'm like in slow motion or something. I'm sorry that I'm having such a hard time grasping this, but I think I'm I think I'm closing in on it. Um, the the UDO requirement is that there be a sidewalk along the frontage of this property, and the request is to not put the sidewalk in uh, and not pay the fee in lieu, but instead do a sidewalk extension offsite. So that's really what we're talking about. It's the variance is we don't wanna put the sidewalk in the right of way. Um, and we don't think we can put the sidewalk on our property because that will interfere with our uh, low impact design approach that we're proposing and we don't want to pay fee in lieu, what we would like to propose is an, uh, a sidewalk continuation elsewhere. Have I, staff, have I adequately explained what's going on? Uh, yes. That's okay. Good. Are they allowed, could off premise sidewalk be something that the city could even consider um, as uh, as a solution here? Is that in the realm of even allowable to begin with? Uh, it's not something the UDO necessarily allows. Um, however, if you know if, if the property owners agreed to it, um, it would have to be it would have to be okay with that. But it also has to be okay um, with the city to allow it in right away, unless it would be on someone's private property. Okay, so we're not sure if the, if it, so this might conceivably be something that could be done, though there's still more questions. So to my next question, which is to the attorney, um, Krista, if we approve this, does that if we were to say, okay, you know, let's say that an off offsite sidewalk would be acceptable here in this situation, and I'm not saying that. Let's just hypothetically we go down that road. Is that a condition that needs to go inside this variance? Or Mr. Wardell. Hello? Uh, yes. Uh, so you got a couple issues there. I, I was waiting for Krista to chime in. I think she may have stepped away for a second. But sorry. I was having sorry, I was having um, connectivity issues with my headphones. Uh, Mr. Wardell, feel free to proceed. Um, with what you're going to say. 
yes, I think it would be a condition, uh, and certainly the condition would have to be agreed upon uh, by the applicant. So uh, that would be, you know, that, that would be the issue. Um, so if you could have the applicant agree to the condition, and the condition could be uh, a condition of the variance, and then it could be enforceable uh, through essentially through consent. Thank, thank you. So, so the variance that we're considering is we we don't want to put the sidewalk in because in the in the rezoning case there was a planning commissioner who said keep the trees, but it's in the right of way. So the city really I assume that's a state road. I don't know for sure. Um, so could you, uh, applicant, would you mind explaining again why the sidewalk, the, the alternative sidewalk placement couldn't take place uh, on, on, in, on, the, on your, in, in your part of the development? It looks like in the site plan, there's a, a, a walking trail that, that perhaps covers, you know, maybe 60% of the distance of the, of the lot's frontage. Is, is there some way to, to, um, to, to configure that so that you could get something that would meet the requirement without having to do the variance? Yeah, can so, we go to the next slide real quick? It, it shows a zoom up portion of the, um, the property where we're talking about having um, a steep slope condition. So to the Northern edge of our property, the the soil, the ground slopes significantly to the north. And so one option would be to put in a retaining wall to continue the sidewalk to meet ADA requirements. When the sidewalk is in the right of way, it does not need to meet ADA requirements. So it doesn't have to have a very shallow slope, but if it's on our property, it does. Um, so if we put a retaining wall in with a sidewalk, then when we got to the end of our property, there would be a drop off and you would have to figure out how you're getting back to the street, it would basically end you at this conservation area. Or as Luke was saying before, you would have to put in a very long sidewalk that's winds back and forth and back and forth in order to maintain that very shallow uh, sidewalk grade. And at that point, people are just going to walk on the other side of the road if there's sidewalk there. I think one thing that's worth mentioning too is the solution that we're proposing while it's, you know, quote unquote, off-site sidewalk that off-site sidewalk the intention of that is to allow pedestrian access along this portion of rivermont drive which is essentially what would happen you know in, in in the to meet the requirements of the udo you know you provide pedestrian access along your frontage in the public right-of-way so that you know pedestrians can can walk down rivermont drive and that and that's what the the intent of the offsite sidewalk is it's not it's not just arbitrary sidewalk improvements um, but yeah the the grading challenges on the site would probably require a lot of ada ramps that would not be a pleasurable experience for a pedestrian who's trying to walk along our frontage um, and then adjusting the site in any way to to compensate for that is going to mean that we're going to affect more trees and we're going to add more impervious and potentially not meet the requirements for low impact design. Chair, I have one last question for staff and that is whether or not this is a, a state road or if this is a, a city road. Give me, give me one second. I will look up that for you. Oh, we'll come back to you on that question if you'll uh, keep that in mind. Uh, Mike, Terry. I actually had a, a question for Cole as well. Um, but I think if, if I'm hearing things correctly, at, at the time the rezoning was approved, um, they committed to preserving the evergreens on the east side of the, the roadway. That's correct. Um, with the understanding at that time that sidewalk was only required on one side of the street and so it could be constructed on the opposite side so and now if i understand there's been an ordinance change that requires sidewalk on both sides of the street so i'm, I'm looking for clarification on a, my understanding correct and two when that when that text change was made to the unified development ordinance all right one more my internet is 
working, so I'm trying to trying to get uh, the street question answered first. I don't know if it helps. We are in the county. It's about 50 feet into the county, but this road starts in the city and ends in the county. I think the question uh, to me, I want to make sure, Mike, is whether the state maintains the road or another entity. Or not Mike, uh, uh, or Chad. Indeed. I, I mean, from my point of view, I don't know that if it's a state road, the, the, the city can, can necessarily lawfully apply a zoning condition to, to state right of way. All right. Well, while... <laughs> Uh, Cole's working on two different questions now, uh, 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 and we'll we'll follow up on those. Uh, Regina, have you got a question to the applicant? Yeah, um, you keep talking about low impact design. What is um, the advantage, and what is the of of having low impact design? Are there <clears throat> economic considerations, uh, or is this just um, a desire on the part of the people who are planning to build this? Luke, do you want to take that, or should I? Yeah, sorry. I was trying to I was trying to unmute. Um, low impact design is uh, from a stormwater perspective is basically taking measures to go above and beyond the general state and local requirements for stormwater treatment. So this would be um, this is not an economic advantageous uh, design consideration. This is kind of sets projects apart from from others um, and basically on this site, we're doing that through a large dedication of conservation area to the natural um, forest that's nearby the site. So one of our goals for it is that typically when you are putting a large amount of impervious surface on a site, you have to grade it so that it all drains into a detention pond. And we didn't want to take down all of our gorgeous trees to mass grade the site and have it all funnel into this one detention pond. And so in order to avoid mass grading the site, we've used these low impact um, measures. Thank you. So it's also, you don't have to have a detention pond. It's to avoid taking down the existing trees so that we don't have to okay. mass grade the site to the detention pond. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. I'll, uh... So, sorry to interrupt. Um, this, this, this is in the city, um, but it is an NCDOT maintained road. Just to clarify. Thank you. Uh, and Mike, uh, were your questions answered? Just want to make sure we've got everything squared everything away. No, I'm just uh, no. I'm still looking for clarification on, you know, at the time the zoning was approved. It sounds like sidewalk was only required on one side of the street. Um, and looking at the aerial imagery, it would make sense to continue that on the opposite side of the street because that's where it exists today. Um, but now I, I understand the variance is because sidewalk is required on both sides of the street. So I'm trying to figure out when the, the timing of that change. I don't I don't know the I don't know the exact date. Um, but uh, I believe it was um, it was it was after they had a the zoning case was approved. It's when it changed. I think it was um, n not long after, um, but I think that was a little after 2018 is when the zoning case was approved. Um, is that is that correct, Daniel? I think that's what we're talking about. I don't remember the exact date. I th it was within a about a year of when our case was approved. Sometime in the following year, uh, the the change happened. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for the applicant? This is Chad. I have one more, and I'm sorry I, I didn't ask hey, it before. It's my last question. Um, and and um, Danielle, is there is there um, you're indicating that you cannot that you don't wish to make the payment in lieu? Is there a hardship for you in terms of making that payment in lieu? I understand finance is not an issue, but I'm just curious why that's not being considered? Well, I mean, it, it's currently the, the option in place, but that would, that would 
not motivate us to continuing the sidewalk on the neighbor's property to reach the state park and that that's an additional cost for us. And so trying to mitigate the cost of installing that sidewalk with the fee um, is of course of interest. Thank you. Great. Sorry, I realized I was muted. Uh, any other questions for the applicant? All right, uh, Ms. Bristol, do you have any, uh, or any, is there anyone else here to speak in favor? Or, or do you, I, you know, Cole, would you mind uh, stop sharing your screen for a moment? Or do you, or Chris rather? Um, all right, uh, is there anyone here to speak against this? Do we have anybody registered? I'm assuming no. All right, then that is a no. Um, Ms. Bristol, do you have anything else uh, that you'd like to, to, you know, before we go into deliberations? You know, I would just like to say that I think in terms of the spirit of the code and its intention to provide pedestrian connection to the things that people want connection to that this proposal to extend the sidewalk does that very well and that it connects our neighborhood to the state port state park access, which is what most people in the area are are interested in. Um, most I ran into somebody this morning who said they walk down there all the time, and that would be lovely to have this um, sidewalk extend all the way to the state park. So, thank you. All right. Uh, any uh, discussion? Thoughts. This is, again, this is a variance, so there is no staff recommendation. This is Chad. Are you starting your polling the board now? I'm going to, I will request everyone say something. You don't have to, but I, I certainly think that it is a, is a fair thing to do and, and something that is a, a part of our duty as a board member. I agree and welcome that, uh, that, that thought process. Um, I... Uh, I'm having a hard time understanding if the, if there is a fee in lieu option available. Um, could not the city use that fee in lieu to extend the sidewalk and remove the need for the variance altogether? Um, you know, I, I don't know uh, the answer there, but I I I'm I, I I'm I'm torn on this one. I'm hoping other people have some some perspective. Uh, Brian, did you have something? I saw your hand raised. Real before. Yes, this, this is actually something that Krista and I discussed uh, pursuant to the rules. If, if you are inclined to deny a request, then you do need to discuss what the reasons are for that pursuant to the rules for 4.4D um, so that when there is an order, there is um, discussion in the record to actually draft the order uh, since that's required. So um, that is a requirement. Thank you, sir. Um, Tisha, you I saw your hand raised. Yeah, I am a, a, a proponent of, of sidewalks in general. And then one of my pet peeves of Durham is, is a lot of sidewalks that just end randomly. So I, I like the that side of this, but I am still a little bit fuzzy on, on the change in the zoning and the need for the 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 variance on the on the other side, but I I like their solution and I, I am inclined to like it. Thank you, uh, Mike. Terry. Yeah, I I think for me, um, I, I feel like there is a hardship here. Um, you know, there was a, there was a commitment made during the rezoning process at at the request of the planning commission to preserve these trees at that time that was agreed upon because the UDO only required sidewalk on one side of the street. Um, since that time, the UDO has been changed to now require sidewalk on on the second or on, on both sides of the street, um, and that therefore would you know prohibit the applicant from being able to meet the, the zoning requirements, um, potentially have to rezone the property in some fashion uh, to remove that, that commitment. So I feel there is a, there is a hardship here. I'm, I'm still um, 
still a little bit torn uh, as, as with Mr. Meadows on, on the fee and Lou, um, if, if that can't be done for the additional portion of the walkway. Uh, but I do, uh, do appreciate their willingness to continue on the west side of the street to the state park as they have presented today. Well said. Uh, anyone else? So I see, I concur. It's it's a tough one. I, you know, they got caught between uh, one commitment uh, to uh, take to take care of the trees, and then they moved the goalpost and said, "Now you have to put it on both sides." Now they're not the same people, but uh, they got caught between trains. Um, I think it's a novel uh, way to. Uh, provide more uh, usable sidewalks um, and the alternative the alternative would be fee and lieu and then they don't have to do anything uh, staff would just like to say um, for clarification that the extra sidewalk does not um, make them meet the requirement for both sides that is just something that providing um, for 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 the the property owners, so that doesn't necessarily meet the requirement of the ordinance to provide. It's not an option to provide extra sidewalk to meet that ordinance. Um, that's just something that they're doing um, on their own that does not meet our requirements. Just to clarify. Mm, thank you. Um, Ian or Mike, do you have anything? I've got a few thoughts as well, but Richless, I'm in support of of uh, granting a variance for this. Um, am as well. And Mr. Tarrant. Hey, it's, it's one final clarification, hopefully, for, for Cole. If, if my understanding is that sidewalk is now required on both sides of the street, is constructing it on the west side not satisfying that requirement? And then we're only really talking about a fee and loop for the east side of the street? So they are providing it on the west side of the street um, and not the east side of the street. Um, so the payment in lieu. Um, would would be for the, the the sidewalk that they're not providing correct. Thank you. All right. Um, you know, I, I I've got to uh, share some thoughts that uh, Regina and, and Chad mentioned uh, as well. Um, I actually agree with them all. Um, you know, and also think uh, I, I wrote the question here on on my on my notebook of saying you know does this meet the spirit purpose and intent? Uh, I think it does. Um, uh, I, I look at uh, putting this on the other side and, and thinking of, you know, a bunch of crisscross uh, uh, ramps going, you know, because of the grading, I understand topographical issues uh, there. And, you know, people would probably just walk the street instead uh, of walking on this sidewalk. So that makes a, a lot of, you know, you know, what, what's, uh, what's the, the purpose here? Uh, and I, I have to agree. Uh, Mike, I don't know if you, or Tarrant, did you have your hand raised or did just not raise lowered from before? Sorry, I just didn't get lowered. I'm sorry. Okay, got it. Um, all right, then. Um, any other thoughts? Does anyone want to offer a motion? I'll make the motion. I hereby make a motion that case number B21, whole bunch of zeros five, an application for a request for variance from the sidewalks on property located at 3912 Rivermont Road has successfully met the applicable requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance is hereby granted subject to the following in conditions. The improvements should be substantially consistent with the plans and all information submitted to the board as part of the application. We've got a motion for approval by Mr. Lacey. Is there a second? Wymore second. Um, Ms. Wymore second. Um, Susan, what do you call? Mr. Kip? Yes. Ms. DeLacy? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Meadows? No. Mr. Ratchless? Yes. Ms. Wymore? 
Yes. Mr. Tarrant? Yes. Motion carries seven to one. Motion carries six to one. Um, six by, to vote, one. <laughs> by a vote of six to one, uh, your, variant, your request for variance has been approved. Uh, well, you'll get an order shortly, and we appreciate you become, uh, coming before the BOA this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you like to call the next case? Okay. Case B21000009, a request for a variance from the project boundary buffer requirements. The subject site is located at 218 North Dillard Street, zoned office institutional and in the urban tier. This case has been advertised for the required period of time and property owners within 600 feet have been notified, notarized affidavits verifying the sign posting at postings and letter mailings are on file. And the seating for this case is Ms. DeLacy, Mr. Kipp, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Retchless, Ms. Wymore, and Mr. Tarrant. Here I am, I muted again. Uh, all right, uh, thank you for that. Uh, would all of the folks who plan on speaking please turn on your video and we'll administer the oath before we continue. Um, so it looks like we're just waiting for Dan and Ed to turn on their screens. If they- They're not gonna speak. Oh, they're not. Okay. Uh, well, if you, the, those who are, uh, please raise your right hand. If you, and do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? Scott? Okay. I, I got to have a verbal yes on everybody. Sorry, guys. Yes. Jeremy? Yes. And Preston? Yes, sir. And I also need a verbal yes on, do you consent to this uh, remote meeting platform? Yes, sir. Yes. I do. Thank you, guys. Um, Eliza. Eliza, take it over. Uh, good morning. Yes, morning, everyone. Eliza Monroe speaking from the planning department. Um, I uh, would like to request that the staff report and all materials submitted be made part of the public hearing. At the public hearing, be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. So noted. Thank you very much. Case B21000009 is a request for a variance from the project boundary buffer requirements. The applicant is Coulter Jewel Thames PA and the subject site is located at 218 North Dillard Street. The case area is highlighted in the thick red. There's a overlay over here. So we're not talking about 513 or 510 Holloway or 212. We're just talking about 218 North Dillard Street. The site is zoned Office Institutional or OI and is located in the urban development tier. As you'll see on the screen, the site area is currently vacant. Uh, for the nature of this request, a project boundary buffers are defined as a portion of a property designated between designated to mitigate impacts between different land uses. Section 9.4 of the Unified Development Ordinance provides the standards for the type, um, quantity, and location of buffering lands, buffer landscaping. So the type of trees and shrubs and the amount of trees and shrubs required is noted within that section. Per Section 9.4.3 of the UNEO, a 20-foot wide buffer. Um, with a 0.6 opacity um, would be required along Peach Street, Peach Tree Street, where the proposed development is adjacent to a right of way that is less than 60 feet wide. Um, if the right of way was greater than 60 feet wide, then they would not have to meet this requirement. Um, the right of way is also across from a parcel that is residentially zoned, as you'll see over here, where it's zoned RUM. Um, in that case, the applicant is requesting uh, to permit a five foot average project boundary buffer along Peach Tree, Peach Tree Street, where the project boundary buffer is required. 
UDO section 3.14.8 establishes four findings that the applicant must make in order for the board to grant a variance. These findings requiring approval are identified in the staff report, and the applicant's responses to the findings are identified in the application, both within your packet. Staff will be available for any questions as needed throughout the hearing process, and the applicant did provide some additional documents that staff will pull up as needed when asked to. Thank you, Eliza. Any questions for Eliza before we move on? I'm seeing some shaking of heads, but if I miss someone that raised a hand physically, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, all right, I don't see any. Um, all right, well, we'll turn it over to the applicant. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's still morning. Thank you for your time today. I know y'all have had a, a long agenda. Um, I will try to be brief, which is difficult for me, those that know me. Um, my name is Scott Harmon with Center Studio Architecture in downtown Durham. We are on the design team and the ownership development team for this project. Um, we are uh, experimenting with a new housing type um, that is sort of born out of some of the changes in the expanding housing choices uh, that was implemented by the city to give pri the private sector opportunities to address some of the housing crisis in uh, this community. So we're creating a, a series of 19 townhomes, each with five individual dwelling suites that could be rented out at a much more affordable rate for someone who wants to live in the Cleveland Holloway neighborhood or uh, downtown. We are also providing commercial space uh, at the corner. This is, a, a, in my opinion, a a, um, the commercial space is at the far right in this image here uh, at the corner of Dillard and Holloway Street. Um, this is a, a gateway location into downtown right in the middle of, I believe, Durham's first historic district. And uh, we wanted a, uh, a, a neighborhood facing commercial um, cafe type establishment um, at this location. We think that's something that uh, is just good urbanism. I think it's being a good neighbor. And I think it's something that the surrounding stakeholders and neighborhood would appreciate in this location. Um, I don't mind having an edge, a, a buffer to our property. I just uh, feel strongly that it should be a friendly edge. Um, a lot of the whole concept of boundary buffers is based on segregated land uses, which I think is problematic. Um, and I know that there are times when uh, they're perfectly appropriate, where what you're trying to do is create a, a condition where you don't see each other. I think in this context, I think that's really bad urbanism. I think it's being a bad neighbor. I think it's not good for safety. Um, so we want nice plants and a low fence where uh, the neighbors know where the edges are, but that we can see one another, we can protect one another, and we can participate in each other's uh, lives in the neighborhood. So we're just simply asking for uh, the opportunity to put in a boundary that, uh, that accomplishes that. I think that's all I wanna say. Our design team and site team at uh, Coulter Jewel and Thames have some additional technical aspects of how we're uh, impacted by this ordinance and our uh, request for the variance. And I'm happy to answer any other questions that y'all have. And thank you very much. All right, any questions for Mr. Harmon before we hear from anyone else? Um, this is Chad. I just want to encourage the applicant to explain um, the, the hardship of complying with uh, with the code requirements. I believe that he alluded to some design considerations and desire and so forth, but to, to enhance that and, and talk about, you know, the hardship of, of compliance would be very helpful. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Chad. Um, so one, uh, as you can see in the diagram, increasing the boundary buffer would reduce the number of dwelling units that we could uh, provide. And so less housing is less impact on the housing crisis of Durham. Um, secondly, a boundary buffer as prescribed by the ordinance there would create an unsafe situation where our neighbors would not be able to see what was going on in the adjacent apartment community right across Peachtree, which is also a residential use. Normally between two residential uses like that, a boundary buffer of this magnitude would not be required, but because of the unique uh, configuration of an odd zoning island or peninsula here, um, it is technically required, although I don't think it is, uh, that providing it is in keeping with the spirit of the ordinance in terms of what it intends. 
So again, we're not trying to eliminate a boundary buffer. I'm just trying to scale it down to one that is appropriate uh, and supports uh, a, a safe, defensible, visible neighborhood interaction um, uh, in this very close to the center of downtown urban environment. And Scott and Chad, this is this is Jeremy Anderson with CJT. Um, I'll cover a few of those things if if uh, if you want me to continue with a little bit of the technical presentation um, at this point. But I'll, I'll, if you had questions for Scott, still, I didn't want to cut you off. No, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, great, appreciate it. Um, and Chad, appreciate that question because I appreciate your clarity on earlier cases today. It's. Uh, you're, uh, you're trying to uh, decipher a lot of information and, and pare it down. So uh, again, good morning, uh, Chairman Rogers, Vice Chair Meadows and members of the board. My name is Jeremy Anderson, uh, landscape architect with CJT, Coulter Jewel Thames, uh, 111 West Main Street in Durham. I uh, have a degree with, uh, of landscape architecture from North Carolina State and have been practicing uh, landscape architecture planning for about 20 years in the Triangle area. Um, I'm the project manager for this project, uh, as well as you know, many other multifamily and townhome projects uh, in the downtown area, you know, in the past five or 10 years. So uh, uh, familiar with the UDO, familiar with requirements um, for a site like this, and uh, also had visited the site many times you know, in preparation of this meeting. Um, quickly, thank you, Eliza, for your, your presentation and your, your staff report. Uh, I think you covered the issues very well. Um, I'm here just to, to provide a little more background information uh, in regards to the current site condition, expectations of the development as outlined in the UDO and specific site conditions unique to the site. Um, finding number one, the unnecessary hardship. Um, the area we're focused on, th this, what you see on the screen here is the overall development, but uh, the one parcel which Eliza alluded to is really the parcel at the corner of Dillard, Holloway, and Peachtree. So it's the, the convergence of all three of those right-of-ways. Um, and it happens to be kind of the narrow pinch point of our site. Um, that previous slide, and you don't have to go back, but it's okay, showed the 10-foot uh, right-of-way dedication that we're being required to dedicate along Peachtree. I think it was in a, in, a, in a purple color there. So we've got 10 feet already taken from the site that kind of restricts, makes this, this narrow corner of the site a little bit narrower. And then the requirement for a 20 foot landscape buffer, um, you know, as Scott alluded to really pinches down this corner. Um, it, would, uh, it would reduce the number of townhomes by two or three. Also probably reduce the commercial space to something that's not usable. So um, it's about 30 feet from the existing property line that we're, we're having to set aside that we couldn't put a building in or couldn't put parking in and would be essentially a, a heavily landscaped buffer. And uh, as Scott alluded to, that's, that's not what the, the vision is. That's not really promoting good urbanism, good walkability, safe pedestrian you know, case um, in this circumstance. Uh, finding number two is hardships peculiar to this property. Um, in addition to the narrowness of the lot at this point that was outlined in number one, um, this zone, this, this property is still zoned O and I, as Eliza mentioned, uh, it's kind of odd. It's a peninsula within the downtown district. It's DD zoned downtown Durham or downtown design district all the way around it, except for this one property line. Um, if it was, uh, if the zone, the property next to us was DD, we wouldn't have a buffer like we have, like we don't have around the remaining piece of the property. Um, or if it was zoned potentially something else, something more residential, we may not have the, the extent of the buffer we have here, but because landscape or because landscape buffers are, are based on the underlying zoning, which is you know, office and institutional here, um, we are being buffered as if we are an office and institutional use and not the residential use that we're proposing. Um, Hard, or finding number three, uh, hardship not as a result uh, of any action taken by the owner. Uh, there's been no changes by the owner that would uh, has, has resulted in this hardship. And number four, consistent with the spirit intent, intent of the ordinance. Um, 
So the variance request again is, is to reduce the area you see in green here as a 20 foot landscape buffer to an average five foot width um, along this area. Um, and what that generally means is we're gonna take the same, um, same amount of area we need to within this green box and kind of redistribute it so that it's narrower in some areas and wider in other areas to get the same square footage, um, but plant it up in a, in, a, in a more urban, more pedestrian friendly um, manner. So again, landscaping is still gonna be proposed in this area, as you can see here and you can see on the rendering, um, but again, something more pedestrian friendly, streetscape friendly uh, versus a densely planted 20 foot buffer um, or wall that uh, would, would kind of block off the, the residential to the to the west of this or east of it excuse me um, furthermore there is a sidewalk being proposed on Peachtree currently there is not so that is within the uh, the right-of-way dedication you see there so we're uh, we're hoping there'll be some more pedestrian activity along Peachtree and again having a 20-foot dense buffer there you know, creates some safety concerns um, uh, if you have something that you can't see through um, the parking lot that you see there um, now being allowed to, to be placed here, if this is approved, uh, provides approximately two spaces per unit, which is uh, what the UDO would require. And uh, it will be screened through the UDO requirements for, for vehicle use screening, uh, as well as a fence along the, uh, the sidewalk. So uh, landscaping and, and you know, appropriate measures are still there to, to kind of buffer the property. Uh, again, the buffer flexibility allows for um, kind of maximum residential units as well as the commercial space uh, at the corner of Holloway and Dillard, um, which we think is very important. And overall, the, the townhouse, the proposed townhouse development, we think is, is in keeping with the density, scale, um, size of units, you know, uh, that the adjacent residential um, is there's there's apartments, duplexes, triplexes um, to the east of this, and, and this is in a, in a similar scale in keeping with that. So to conclude, in my professional opinion, uh, that unnecessary hardships result from the strict application of the ordinance. Um, uh, it is also my professional opinion that the hardship is not the, is not caused as a result of any action taken by the owner. And also in my professional opinion, the requested variances uh, is consistent with the spirit, purpose, and intent of the ordinance for the reasons described above. And with that, that concludes my testimony and I will uh, throw it back to the board for any questions you may have for the development team. All right, uh, Chad, I guess um, you have a question for Mr. Anderson. I do, I, I have two questions. Um, as I understand it, the, the property, which I guess is to the east, it, on the screen, it's the, it's the property that where the two text boxes are located. Um, correct. That, that's a, that's a multifamily use. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay. And so because this property is inside the downtown design uh, district and that property isn't, that's what's triggering the requirement for the perimeter buffer that you're seeking the variance from. Is that accurate? No, actually, neither of these properties are within the downtown design district. That, if it were, then would that buffer be required? Uh, if, if the brown property you see on here, the RUM, which is the adjacent Mm -hmm. uh, multifamily, if it was the kind of gray purple color, which is the downtown, mm -hmm. then it would not be. Mm -hmm. If we were, I mean, it depends, there's various scenarios, but um, if we were downtown design district and that property was not, I think there would be a 10 or 15 foot landscape buffer. Um, but both of them are outside the, the DD. So it's treated like any urban project. Understood. And one last question, which is you are planning to include some landscaping in this area, but it is uh, short of, uh, of the, the 20 foot uh, requirement. And is, is that right? That's correct. There'll be uh, street trees, some additional trees on site, probably more ornamental and landscaping at the edge of the parking lot between the parking lot and the right of way to, to screen the cars, which is a, you know, an important uh, uh, design consideration. So yes, there is landscaping still placed in this area. Thank you.
Uh, uh, Eliza Monroe, before Ms., uh, before DeLacy chimes in, I just wanted to confirm um, what Jeremy was just talking about, about the design districts. So no project boundary buffers are required within the design districts unless the proposed project is adjacent to a residential district that's in the um, residential district or used in the urban and suburban tier. So to confirm what Jeremy was stating about this uh, cool color back here, um, if they were a part of that cool color, uh, they would not necessarily need to have a project boundary buffer. Um, if this one, they, they would both have to be within the design district. Um, if this one was in the design district, they would still have to have that requirement um, just because this one would still be in the urban or suburban tier. Just to clarify that. Thank, Thank you. Eliza. Uh, Regina, you got a question? Thanks. I have a, <clears throat> Hi, Scott. I've got a question you talked about these townhomes as being suites, how did the, could you elaborate further and tell, and tell us how this use differs from the uh, Coco Brown um, property next door to the east? Uh, yes, so imagine what, 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 what we're creating is uh, townhomes for co-living where there are five different adults living in the unit together. They're sharing a kitchen facility and they're sharing laundry facility, but they have private bedroom, private bathroom for each person. And it's a fairly generous, you know, uh, uh, it's a fairly generous uh, private suite. Um, and so, and, and this is entirely allowed uh, in the current ordinance with this zoning and, uh, and in particular because of the recent changes with expanding housing choices to create more flexibility for different housing types. Hmm. The Coco Brown area is, is, is RUM, that's just multifamily apartment, basically apartment flats. Um, in, in the written report uh, from Jeremy, you'll note that the density per acre of that parcel is actually higher than the density per acre of ours. Um, and I think that is, I think that answered all your questions. Please let me know if I missed Thanks something. very much. Yeah, it did. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming up with novel uh, housing solutions. It's oh, you're welcome. very thank important. Uh, Eliza and our staff wanted to chime in one more time with one more clarifying thing. Um, if, you'll, if you'll note in the staff report, uh, we, I simply refer to it as multifamily um, suites. The, the distinction that Mr. Harmon used is not uh, within our UDO, like we don't have a sweet uh, distinction. Um, so in the staff report, uh, we note uh, the RUM zoned parcel as multifamily, and this one is also considered multifamily. We do not have a sweet distinction within the UDO. Thanks, Eliza. Um, Mr. Kip. Hello. Um, just wanted to get some clarification there. Peachtree, Peachtree Place seems extremely narrow of what's actually paved. It's a it's a wider right of way, but I've driven down that. I consider it an alley, and I don't think you can get two cars down there um, without pulling off into the ditch. So it just that's a little bit concerning. Um, uh, so just so I understand it, so instead of the twenty foot boundary buffer, you're proposing a five foot boundary buffer, and the balance fifteen feet is basically going to be parking for those first however many spots, 10 spots. Is that right? That's, that's correct. Okay. And, and to, to, to touch on the peach tree width, um, yeah, we, we're aware and we, we had some conversation with transportation about uh, the width of it. Could it be closed? Could it be converted to an alley? Um, we're not showing any driveways off that, partially for that reason, because it's we don't want to add additional traffic to it, but um, uh, transportation is going to keep it and add additional 10 foot of right away. So um, we're not, I think it was recently paved, but it's still, you know, on the narrow side, but. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, great, thank you. I have another question, Work, workforce housing. So is it just workforce housing because there's five suites or is there actually some kind of deed restriction on who can buy, who can rent? Um, in the, I'm, I'm using the term 
to generally describe what I, what I would consider missing middle housing. This is housing that is not uh, affordable with a capital A using tax credits or subsidies, but uh, so it's entirely market rate housing, but you know, just the, the goal that we have been focusing uh, in the studio on a couple of our most recent projects is how do we create a place for someone who wants to live in the downtown neighborhood that they can have their own space uh, that for under a thousand bucks a month. And there, if you look at all of the new apartments that are being built, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, if you go look for a, for a one bedroom apartment somewhere in downtown right now, or even a studio, you're gonna be paying 12, 13, $1,400 a month. So this housing type allows us to, to, uh, to, to simply just create more affordable housing in terms of the amount that you're paying. And so the, we use the term generally, not, not legally or specifically. Okay. And okay. It's, it's not gonna work for everyone, but I mean, it's a, it's a housing type that you are starting to see a lot in tier one and tier two cities that are trying to find creative ways to just allow more flexibility, different, different ways for people to live together. Co-living is very, very popular and, and the better examples of it are definitely providing places, very stable, desirable places for people to live with a greater sense of community and connection to their, their uh, roommates and neighbors um, and, and also addressing you know, affordability in general. Um, Eliza and with the planning department here uh, with a couple of more clarifications. Um, so at this time, there is not a workforce housing uh, language within the Unified Development Ordinance. Um, the only language we do have is affordable housing. And I want to make a distinction that affordable housing does have specific criteria that must be met in order for property to be deemed affordable. That includes uh, market values, a report that's submitted to um, various city departments. Uh, so at this time, the housing if you'll, as I noted in the report, we're just distinguishing it as multifamily. And at uh, this time we don't have workforce housing as a distinction within the UDO. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Harmon for providing additional clarification about what that meant. Uh, but there is not anything within the UDO in which we require the applicant at this time to provide a report or a uh, uh, annual report or sorts to uh, keep that uh, intent in line to ensure that it's being met. So just to provide some clarity there. Uh, Mike Tarrant, you got a question? Yeah, I just um, just kind of thinking about this and, and thinking about you know how cities grow and develop and street street networks are created over time. You know, we always end up with sort of odd parcels such as this that are are very difficult to develop in any fashion. Um, so it, it, in that regard, just the the geometry of this particular property, I think, is um, creates a hardship um, that that um, you know, I, I think is appropriate. Um, and the fact that this is O and I, you know, just on the outside of, of when the DDS was created, it, it seemed like it could have been easily captured in that, in, in that, you know, creating the project boundary buffer in um, somewhat of an urban setting is, you know, not, not really uh, appropriate in my, in my professional opinion. Um, so I, I think that is a hardship as well that, that further restricts the development potential for this particular property. Um, I, I do appreciate the, um, the applicant not trying to you know, reprieve themselves from meeting that commitment, but instead extending that total buffer area along, uh, along peach tree um, to, create a, to create an edge along the entire property instead of a buffer on just a poor portion of it. And I think um, in doing so, that, that really does uh, better meet the, the spirit and intent of the ordinance in, in this particular case. So um, I, I appreciate the... Um, presentation here today, and I think I'll support this, uh, this application. Thank you, Mr. Tarrant. Any, anyone else? Any questions for the applicant? I concur with uh, Mr. Tarrant and Stretchless. Um, just be, because of the, uh, the unique uh, peninsula parcel, um, but it's a well thought out project, and I'm definitely for uh, uh, the variance. Thank you, sir. Um, Lacey, I concur. Um, it's novel housing, and it's uh, it's a very tough little peninsula. Um, and I think it's a very clever solution to the problem. 
This is Chad. Since we seem to be in board discussion, um, I'll just say, you know, in my observations, we've got a convergence of zoning standards versus some policy issues. You know, we've got a desire to address a housing crisis. We've got some weird zoning configuration here. Um, it, it, you know, it's not lost on me that these are two multifamily uses. They're side by side. Normally, we wouldn't buffer those. Um, but because they're in dist different districts, we're, we're requiring this buffer. Um, and, you know, certainly this is a downtown area. And I have to agree with all of the comments that, you know, large suburban style uh, use buffers probably aren't appropriate in downtown. So I too support the variance. Thank you. Anyone else? Tisha, how about you? I am in support of this. I think it's a great solution for, uh, you know, multifamily affordable housing and certainly um, the buffer was was put in there for other uses and other restrictions, but I think that they've had are proposing a great um, solution to it from with the restrictions that they've been dealt. Uh, Eliza Monroe staff, sorry to be that stickler, but uh, this is not deemed affordable housing by the UDO standards. Sorry. That's, that's <laughs> my term. We no. got it. <laughs> I, I think. Can um, we say not deucedly expensive? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Um, you know, I, I share everyone's thoughts. You know, one of the things uh, uh, we have discussed when it comes to variances, uh, changes in design. So uh, uh, could you change the design to meet uh, whatever, um, you know, say, so that you don't need a variance? I, I think that this is... Uh, a clever design and I think it's uh, well suited and, and certainly meets the uh, spirit, purpose and intent. Um, I think that we need to, just because this project is sexy and something new is not a reason to approve it. Uh, I don't think that we should apply different standards to this project than we do any other variants just because we like it. Uh, I actually think that's incredibly inappropriate. But uh, I obviously support this and I support um, um, this, but I, I, I've made some notes to, uh, to, to go over the next time we have a variance request and decide and discuss some of these same things. Um, but um, that, those are my thoughts, personal thoughts. Uh, does anybody else have any, um, any, 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 anything they'd like to add? <laughs> this is this this is Chad. Did you call for anybody in support or opposition? I don't remember if that happened. If it well, did, I, good, I appreciate you saying that. I, I was just looking around to make sure that we uh, see. I was going to ask if there's anybody else to speak in favor. Scott, is there any? I mean, I, I see other people on the call, but I, it doesn't look like they're going to be speaking. I I don't know. No, okay. no one else was. No one else from our side. Thank you. All right. Was there anyone here to speak against this uh, or in opposition? I, I'm. I don't see anybody on here, but within the, on the call. All right, I'll say, I guess not. Um, well, this is a variance again. There is no staff recommendation. Is uh, Would anybody like to offer a motion? Lacey, I hereby make a motion. The application number B21, a whole bunch of zeros, nine, a request for a variance from the project boundary requirements on property located at 218 North Dillard Street has successfully met the applicable requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and is hereby granted <clears throat> subject to the following conditions. The improvements shall be substantially consistent with the plans and all information submitted to the board as part of the application. All right, we've got a, a motion by Mr. Lacey to approve. I, is there a second? Meadows. Got a, a second by Meadows. Before we vote, uh, Cole's got his hand up. What's that? What you got, Cole? Maybe that was by accident. We'll, we'll assume it was. Um, Susan, what'd you call? Miss Wymore? Yes. Mr. Ratchless? Yes. 
Mr. Tarrant? Yes. Ms. DeLacy? Yes. Mr. Meadows? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Kip? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. By vote of seven to zero, your request for a variance has been approved. We appreciate you coming before the BOA. You'll get an order soon. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you much. All. Appreciate it. Hope you get some lunch soon. <laughs> we will. Yes. Thank you very um, much. Before the next case, I don't know if there's interest in taking a quick break or if we want to just uh, power through it. Uh, thoughts, Mike, you got it? You want a five minute break? Please. All right, well, let's take a five minute break. It's 12.03. We'll be back at 12.08. 1210. Let's make it 1210.
out. I think we've got everyone except Mike and Regina, but once they get back, we'll get started. Here we go. Um, Susan, would you like to call the next case? Case B21000010, a request for a variance from the requirements to not place a service area along the street frontage and for a service area to be 20 feet from the building corner. The subject site is located at 509 North Mangum Street and is zoned Downtown Design Support 1 and in the downtown tier. This case has been advertised for the required period of time and property owners within 600 feet have been notified. Notarized affidavits verifying the sign postings and letter mailings are on file. The seating for this case is Ms. DeLacy, Mr. Kip, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Retchless, Ms. Wymore, and Mr. Tarrant. All right. Um, so everyone who plans on giving testimony on this will need your uh, video on. And Dan Jewell raised his hand. Uh, that's what it says. Uh, Jacob? Yes? Is, uh, is this the case where one of the members will be recusing themselves? No. Okay. So uh, well, the, the motions at the end were, are, have been are withdrawn, so they won't be heard today. I think that right. was what would be recusing. Um, right. So everyone who plans on giving testimony will need you to uh, raise your right hand. You swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give today is the truth and nothing but the truth. I'll yes. need a full yes from everyone. Got yes. Yes. Uh, Preston? Yes. Dan? Yes. Lindsay? Yes. All right. Um, and do you all consent to this remote meeting platform? I'll need a verbal yes from everyone. Yes. 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 And Rice and Powell, uh, did, did you take the oath Were you on video? Uh, I, I was not on video, but I, I, I said yes in my office by myself. <laughs> Go ahead for the sake of the, the, the record, uh, uh, Minister of the Oath, you, uh, if you'll raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, Cole, is this one yours? It is. Take it over. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yes. Chris Cooker, City Attorney's Office. Um, sorry, I know that uh, Mr. Wardell just brought this up, but I do want to clarify. Um, Mr. Meadows, is this the one that you were intending to recuse on? No, ma'am. This is I'm good for this one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I'm tired. I apologize to everybody. I forgot to send you a note. I apologize. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, good morning again. Uh, I guess good afternoon now. Um, I'm Cole Reniger, uh, representing the planning department. 
Uh, planning staff requests the staff report and all materials submitted to the public hearing to be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. So noted. Thank you, sir. B21000010 is a request for variance from the requirements um, to not place a service area along a, a street frontage and for a service area to be um, at least 20 feet from a building co corner. Um, this case area is highlighted in red. The site is in the downtown tier um, DD design, downtown design district and is within the city of Durham's city of Durham's jurisdiction. The existing use is a uh, commercial retail, which right now is advanced auto parts. Um, Lizzie, Lindsay Crutchman on behalf of the developer SUPDC LLC requests a variance from the requirements that service areas not be placed on street frontage and that the service areas should be at least 20 feet from the building corner. The site is zoned downtown design district support one and in the downtown tier. For Unified Development Ordinance Section 16.2.3A3, unless the development site is found, sorry, is bound by right of way on all sides, no service area shall be permitted along the frontage of the streets. The applicant proposes to have a service area along the frontage of North Mangum Street, its only frontage. Um, this is a service area that is for parking garage entry and a stairwell. In addition, the applicant requests a variance from UDO section 16.2.3B1, which states the service area shall be at least 20 feet from any building corner with street frontage. The service area is proposed 16 feet from the corner of the building. Um, section UDO, UDO section 3.14B establishes the findings listed below that the Board of Adjustment must make in granting a variance. These findings and review factors are identified in the staff report and the applicant's responses to the findings and review factors are identified in the application, both within your packets. Staff will be available for any questions. Well, the map we have here is not of the case that we're looking at. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me pull to the right one then. Uh, thank you for pulling that to me. Um, one second. It's pulling up. <laughs> oh. And the applicant does have um, exhibits that they have. So I will present those as needed. Um, this is one of the ones under review because we don't have a clean copy. Um, but here is the service area that they're referring to where the entrance will be to the garage. And here's the corner of the of the of the building. Right in this area. Okay. Um, any questions for Cole? through here Jeff what you got I <laughs> uh, my question so there's an advance auto here it's coming down where the the applicate the applicant is seeking to put I guess some um, some apartments and uh, some, it appears to be some structured parking and it's the, the, the auto entry um, that's located on the, on the front of the building that's requiring this variance, or is there some sort of other aspect to this, to this entryway other than just automobiles getting to the parking deck? I'm, I'm confused about that. I'm sorry. What was, what was the, first part of that i'm sorry i know i got the last part but 
you dropped out for me. Am well, I? I apologize. So the, the first part was just, you know, it looks like this is an application to build apartments and a parking deck. And the, the variance is for a service area. Uh, but to me, it looks like the service area is simply the access to the parking garage. Am I missing something? No, that, that's correct. Um, that, that is, uh, as our UDO defines it, it defines as, uh, as entrances to parking as a service area. Okay. Uh, so that's how the UDO defines it. The, the reason these in the ordinance is deemed is because um, generally uh, when you have a, an alley, um, you have to use that for access. I see. Um, but in this case, um, they feel like the alley isn't sufficient. Um, so they're uh, proposing to get a variance from that to place the service area on the street frontage. Which, Will there be access to the, it appears as though there's access to the alley as well. Am I reading that correctly from um, the I'll, I'll let them talk to that. Um, to, okay. to, 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 I think it, it might just be one way traffic, but I'll let them speak to that to be more Thank specific. Thank you, sir. No problem. Uh, any other questions for Cole before we hear from the applicant? I'm just looking through here, I don't see any. Um, would the applicant come forward? I'm not sure who is speaking first. Yes, hello, uh, Chairman Rogers and fellow board members. I'm, I'm Dan Jewell with, with CJT. Uh, thank you. Uh, Cole, that's a good exhibit to start with. Thank you so much for bringing that up. If you can just leave that up for, no for the time being, great. Uh, again, Dan Jewell, uh, CJT, we are the uh, civil engineers and, and landscape architects for this project. Uh, our office is just five blocks down Mangum Street at 111 West Main, and I reside at 1025 Gloria Avenue. Uh, with me here this afternoon are Lindsay Krishman, the project architect with Klein Design, who will also provide testimony, as well as Preston Royster, a professional engineer with our office and the project manager on this, as well as Bryson Powell with the development team who will help answer questions. Uh, and, and thank you for all the time you're putting in this morning to uh, hear all of these, these cases. Um, uh, Cole, the uh, image seems to have disappeared. Is there a way to bring that back up again? Sorry, is that better? That's perfect, thank Sorry you. Sorry about that. We'll go with what we got, all right. Um, uh, again, a bit of background on my credentials. Uh, I have a professional degree in landscape architecture from Purdue University. I've been practicing as a licensed landscape architect for 38 years now, uh, the last 35 of those, 36 of those in North Carolina, with the bulk of that experience in Durham. Uh, most of that work involves design and preparation of site plans, uh, very similar to this project. Specific to this case, uh, the US, UDO has made a, a, a generalized attempt to establish a set of prescriptive design rules uh, and try and make them apply to every situation. That's what a form-based code is. Um, but every site has quirks, uh, every site has situations, every site has things that are specific uh, to, to each. So there's, there's no such thing as chapter 16 of the UDO being able to accommodate one size fits all for everything. Um, I know a bit about that. Uh, I was privileged to sit on the Citizens Advisory Committee that helped guide uh, the creation and adopted of the UDO 15 years ago. And I also served on the Citizens Advisory Committee that helped with the creation of the Downtown Design District Mapping and Rules, Chapter 16, which is why we are here today. And those rules were always intended to have some flexibility in cases with hardship, which of course is why we are here with you today. In this specific case, the hardship is created by uh, a couple of factors. The vision for downtown that chapter 16 of the UDO guides and the reason that we have a downtown design district is for a denser, more urban form of development that promotes a mix of uses and a high level of much needed housing opportunities. As you all know, we are still on a, on a, on a shortage of supply issue to meet the growing demand for housing in Durham. This is housing that will allow residents to live downtown, support all of our great local businesses that have been suffering a bit here over the last 12 months. And our proposal furthers that vision providing, by providing just those housing opportunities in a scale and a form that is prescribed by the UDO. For better or for worse though, the need for parking is still a reality in 2021. 
as much as I hold out hope that at some point our culture will be, move beyond being car dependent, we are not yet there. The market still demands parking and the banks still demand parking in order to get a project finance. And parking is at the crux of our variance request. Uh, and uh, I think this will explain Mr. Mr. Meadows' question a little bit more. Our initial design proposal was in fact to allow all of the parking to access the alley in the rear. Uh, so that dark gray area on the, uh, the left side of the page that you're, you're looking at. Uh, the UDO requires that if you have an alley, you're supposed to access the alley. Uh, unfortunately, we ran into the realities of what is a relatively narrow one-way alley, as all alleys in Durham are, uh, and what that alley could accommodate, and most importantly, what the city transportation and public works departments would actually allow us to do. That portion of the alley that stubs to the rear of this property, again, the gray area in the, uh, the exhibit you're looking at, um, is, uh, is one way. Uh, we were able to successfully request a variance through the Public Works Department from their reference guide to allow two-way traffic on that stretch of alley. Uh, but we also had to commit to actually a very novel solution that we have uh, a traffic control gate signal, so to speak, so that only one car at a time could go in and out of that alley. So we were able to solve the problem of being able to access that alley at all. Otherwise, we would have ended up with, with a situation like a, a Roach Motel. Car could, cars could go in, but they could not go out. So Public Works granted that. And although that solved the two-way situation, uh, the folks in city transportation uh, still said the amount of parking that you are providing on this site is more than can be accommodated in an alley, in a public alley of this scale. Uh, so uh, because of that, they required that we actually disconnect the lower level of parking. And I, I failed to explain. So this site slopes uh, to, the, to the back toward the alley. So there's a lower level of parking that is a full floor below the Mangum Street level. And then there's a street level of parking on Mangum Street, which is sort of the, uh, the view that you see here today. Uh, but the transportation department did not want all, both levels to exit and enter in the alley on the back. Therefore, uh, we, were, we were required uh, to have an additional access on Mangum Street. And that is the location there in the, uh, the, 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 the right side where it says auto entry service. So half of the automobile traffic will use that one, and the other half will be the lower, the lower with, with no connection in between. Um, so short of eliminating that second level of parking, which would have reduced the building program to a size that is not feasible to develop, but most importantly for you, is certainly not in keeping with the goal for uh, a bigger, livelier, more populous downtown. Uh, a smaller building would not have contributed to that goal. There are also specifics having to do with the width and configuration of the site and the dimensional requirements that, that uh, are required for parking decks that would require that the driveway on Mangum be located where it is, thus requiring the very modest reduction of the required 20 feet of separation from that upper right corner of the building to the service entry rather than the 16 feet uh, that we are able to do because of all of these issues. Uh, keep in mind, that's a reduction of only four feet of that width, which is literally um, a step and a half or a blink of an eye if you're walking up the street uh, past the property. Also keep in mind someday that there will be, we're sure, another building built to the north of this site, uh, meaning that uh, the, the goal of not having uh, big un, unglazed openings of the, of the building will actually be met through a nice continuous storefront at some point in the future. Uh, so before I turn it over to the project architect, uh, Ms. Kreshman, to speak a bit more about the technical issues having to do with the parking layout and also how our variance request is still very much in keeping with the spirit, purpose, and intent of the ordinance, 
Uh, I'll close my testimony by saying that in my professional opinion, unnecessary hardship would result from the strict application of the ordinance and that the hardship results from conditions that are peculiar to this property and that those hardships did not result from actions taken by the applicant or the property owner. So uh, thank you for this time. And I'd now like to turn it over to uh, Lindsay. Chad, is your question specifically to Dan? It is. Uh, I have a few questions, but the, the one that is most specific, I just needed a piece of clarity. Dan, you mentioned that the, um, was it the city that said you must have a second egress? Um, was, was that, um, was that the direction from Public Works or, or, or quote unquote the city? Um, or was this second method of ingress egress uh, from, the, from the applicant's volition? So it, it, it's a combination. We need two levels of parking to support the project, the scale of the project. The city would only allow us to access the lower level from the alley. They would not allow us to access the upper level from the alley. Okay, and, and one more follow on question. Um, is it possible to change the configuration of the alley? Does right of way or space exist to uh, upgrade that so that the, the level of traffic to, created from the use could, could use the alley? Is that a possibility? Uh, uh, no, sir, it is not because we did explore that to much length. Uh, there are, there are uh, ownership issues on either side of the alley. We don't control those. And uh, it's not simply the, the gray stub of an alley that uh, the transportation folks felt we, they could only handle so much traffic. It's also that portion of the alley on the, uh, the far left that uh, goes from uh, street to street along the back of the uh, uh, the, the, the senior center. So we, we tried, but we couldn't get there with uh, ownership and volume. Thank you. Um, Tisha, um, you have a question? Yes, hi, um, I do for Mr. Jewell. Thank you for your presentation. I, I just need a little bit more clarification to what follow on to Mr. Meadows question. Um, the Mangum Street where it says auto entry, would also be the exit for that level. Is that correct? Because there's only one, they're not connected by levels. Is that right? Uh, Dan Jewell again. Yes, ma'am, that is correct. Okay, and then same with the lower level would only be alley exit and, and, and entrance. Uh, yes, ma'am, Dan Jewell again, that is correct. Thank you. All right, um, Dan, yeah, I'll turn it back over to you. I know you were had someone else. Yes, I'd like to, uh, uh, with your permission, allow our project architect, uh, Lindsay Critchman, to speak a little bit more about the peculiarities of the parking and how we still meet the intent of the UDO. All righty, Lindsay. Good afternoon, Lindsay Critchman. As Dan mentioned, I'm the architect and project manager. Um, I'm with Klein Design Associates. I am registered in, I'm a registered architect in North Carolina with a master's of architecture from NC State University. I have been designing projects in the DD district of Durham for a little over 10 years now. So I have encountered a lot of different conditions um, where sites do not meet the direct intent of the UDO as, as Dan alluded to. Um, this is definitely one of them. Um, I will say that we identified these issues very early on and we brought them to the attention of Cole and Bo before we even had the first round of site plan um, comments. So we're at the point now where we have an almost completely approved site plan um, submittal package in this variance is kind of that last piece to approval. We have done everything that we can um, on the design of the building to get this to meet the intent and the spirit of the UDO. Dan did a very good job of describing this exhibit and how you know, we're being pulled from two directions from transportation and the UDO pulling this project to choose two different sides of the site. Um, so we've, we've compromised and you know, we have one entrance on one side and one entrance on the alley side, which I think is a great solution. Um, to reduce the traffic impact um, to both of the sides of the site. Another thing that we did regarding the function of the building to meet the, UD, the intent of the UDO is that you can see on this exhibit that we moved the trash and the move-in 
And all of that, the things that you think of that are actually service, um, we've moved them all to the alley. And so that is definitely the intent of the UDO. Um, so all of that service function will not be along Mangum. The only service that we have along Mangum is that in and out um, entrance into the parking deck and then the code required stair egress um, that is required on this side of the site um, for fire safety. And I wanted to point out one other thing about this part of the variance is we did reduce as part of our um, working with um, Cole on this, we did make sure that our total service width along this frontage is less than 20% of the frontage, which if service was allowed on Mangum Street on this site, that is the UDO requirement. So we would be meeting the UDO if it was allowed on Mangum Street. Um, Eliza, I believe you're presenting now. Could you go to the next exhibit? I wanna talk a little more about the second part, um, the second variance that we're requesting. This goes hand in hand. If we're saying we are allowed to um, have this auto entry on Mangum, um, if we do end up saying that that is going to be granted, um, the geometry of the building is what causes the second variance to be needed. So the width, of, the hardship for this part of the variance um, is I'm going to do my best to describe it and definitely if you have questions, let me know. The width of the site, um, we started laying it out and we've studied this parking configuration a, a lot of different ways. Um, we have to connect to the existing alley and you can see we're kind of flaring the alley to even get into the drive aisle. So we push the building to the south um, as much as we can. And then we laid out our typical parking bays, which are required dimensions per the UDO with drive aisles and parking stalls. And when we get to the northern edge of the property, we have a 10 foot setback from the private property line. And that is for fire um, code required separation and then also constructability so that we're not encroaching on the private property, the adjacent private property. So what that does, it, it's a, the hardship is the width of the site. Um, so it makes that last bay of parking an angled parking bay. So in order to keep our parking um, ratio as it needs to be for the site, we um, have those angled parking spaces and we've aligned the drive aisle with that. We've increased it as much as we possibly could on the site and it got us to 16 feet. We're really, really close. Um, the UDO doesn't want to have a service area on the corner. Um, that's the intent of the requirements. So you can see the kind of rendering blow up um, to the right of the exhibit. We created this active use space um, with a good amount of glazing and an entrance to the street so that you're not seeing service on the corner. We've pushed all of the service area, the riser rooms and all of that back from the street over 20 feet. So we are complying with the UDO as far as how far back the service areas are um, from Mangum. It's just the drive aisle geometry that is causing the 16 feet. Um, and Eliza, if you can go to the next slide, um, I'll just end. Um, the last point is looking at this corner. Um, to the right is the drive entrance for Mangum Flats um, currently, and of course that could be developed in the future. Um, but walking down the street here, you can see the, you know, the, to the right, the bottom right corner is where that active space is. And if you're walking as a pedestrian, if this was a 20 foot wide space, the pedestrian experience would be equal. I don't think anyone would really see the difference if that um, was shifted over, but it would have huge ramifications to the building um, and the feasibility of um, this development working. Um, and I will leave it um, there for questions. Chad, do you have a question for Ms. Kretz? I do, I do, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, would you, uh, were there um, any other additional design considerations regarding the entryway or, or the, 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 the driveway proper uh, for the vehicle entrance um, Mangum? I assume that the standards that we're dealing with are trying to, you know, keep our, our, our building facade pedestrian oriented and minimize the, uh, the amount of automobile character um, to, to the building facade. Can you talk a little bit about anything that you guys did uh, as part of your design to address those kinds of concerns? If anything. Yes, definitely. 
um, Lindsay Kretschmann, we looked at a few different locations for this auto entry and we settled on this location because um, it can integrate into the architecture. And so when you look at this building, it isn't prominent. It's not something that jumps out to you as a service area. Um, the other part of it is we wanted the rest of the space um, to be contiguous. So when you're walking as a pedestrian, you have as much contiguous storefront and active area as possible, um, rather than placing it you know, in the middle of the site or something like that. Did that answer your question? It, it did, thank you. Will there be any sort of roll down gate or any sort of um, appurtenance that stretches across the entrance that raises and lowers as vehicles come and go, or will it just be open? There is a security gate. Um, it is recessed um, more than 20 feet, um, I believe from the right of way so that a car can pull in and wait um, behind the gate without blocking traffic. Okay, so there's a there's a, a, a there's a recess in the building wall that's at least 20 feet deep for a vehicle to sit, and as while the gate's coming up, um, and and what is the material of the of the gate? It will be um, powder coated steel, so a dark color. Okay. Um, Thank you. Any other questions for the witness? All right. Uh, Mr. Rogers, Dan Jewell, that does conclude our testimony. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. Um, any questions, you know, any final thoughts on, on uh, any, uh, not final thoughts, but questions for the applicant? Just one more time. This is Chad. I have one more question for the, for the staff, um, which is, uh, where are we on parking? Are they providing, proposing more parking than would be required or how how did that fare? So parking for the design district, um, there is no minimum requirement. Okay. Um, so the, park, the parking they're providing is, I guess, um, is what the applicant wants. So to the applicant, um, how many spaces per unit are being provided? We are providing one space per dwelling unit, which is, um, I, I crunched a few of the numbers looking a few years back at the multifamily projects in downtown Durham. Um, the parking that's provided for those projects is one per bedroom. So if that was translated to this project, we would have 25 additional parking spaces. So we are pushing the envelope to have as few parking spaces as we possibly can. Um, and we're getting there. We, we would love to design a project with less and less parking. Um, so we really can't afford to lose any um, or it, it isn't leasable for the units. Thank you. All right, any, any other questions for the applicants? All right, um, is there anyone here to speak against this application? Uh, all right, uh, Darlene Wall, I'll give you a couple of minutes. Okay, um, my name's Darlene Wall and I'm president of Public Hardware. Our business is next door to the plan project at 509 North Mangum Street. We've been here since 1995. Um, my problem, I have, I know they have their building units for occupancy and that's good that's a good thing i understand the need for parking um but what i don't agree with is the fact that that park that alley the tenants would be coming through that alley to get to that lower parking deck my only issue with that is the fact that central park middle school is right behind this building that they're going to build. And that alleyway goes right behind Central Park Middle School. Now, they don't have a lot of room back there, but, you know, they have a, a picnic table. When I'm walking my dog, sometimes I can see a class out there or a few kids out there just, you know, messing around. But this, it, I feel it's too close. I feel it's, it's going to cause a potential problem in in many ways you know kids are kids they're throwing a the ball and you know they're not going to be looking behind them 
as much. It could happen. That's all. That's all I know. <laughs> um, and I and I just think that it's it's a. Um, I can't find the words I'm thinking about. I I just think that it would be a hazardous to those kids. Um, it could be. And then there's the fact that when school is in session, um, the parents do go down that alleyway. They and probably 15 minutes school when school's getting out. A lot of times there's parents parked on Mangum Street to get to the alley down Seminary Street and down in the alley that's on the back side of the um, storage place right behind us. And so that's my main issue is the is this too close to the school? That is my issue. I have no problem with them building the stuff next door. That's a good thing for Durham, you know, but that is my only issue. And I feel like that was enough for me to be able to speak up about it. And I appreciate you giving me that opportunity. Uh, thank you, Ms. Why are, are you worried about traffic? Is that what you're saying? I, I, I don't know if I'm not, 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 not traffic. Um, just the, the small size of that alley, for one thing, I know they're trying to extend it out, I'll, however how many feet, but it's so close to that school. And the other, and alley, I think it's alley 27, it, it goes behind the storage place behind us. And then it meets where they would be required to be able to go up into, I mean, go down into the parking deck that they're proposing. But that to turn to get to that parking deck is right in right at the back of that school i mean it's, it's right there i think it's something that should be looked into and you know whatever you decide you decide but i i really feel that it should be considered okay uh, well thank you mrs ball uh is there anyone else here to speak against this uh case looking around Going once, going twice. All right. Um, all right. Uh, any uh, uh, any thoughts from the board board members? Deliberation. Uh, I have one more question for Dan Rexels here. Absolutely, Mr. Rexels. <clears throat> um, maybe it's for Cole too. Is that? Did I hear that was a one way alley? Uh, yeah, Dan Jewell. Uh, yes, sir. All all alleys in Durham are officially one way. My experience is that people are only driving on them one way at a time, <laughs> but nobody. Right. But but officially, officially, they are all one ways. Yes, sir. And what is the direction of that alley? I cannot answer that. Cole, would you know? I also do not know the direction of that alley. This is Chad. I can. I can. My son went to Central Park, uh, and you travel that alley from the north. So you um, that you you come in from goodness. What's the name of the road? Hold on a minute. Let me pull the site plan up. That's right. Yeah, and you uh, you turn. So you would be you drive along the school. You come. You turn in at the storage place. Go down the hill, and then come along the school. Uh, and turn, I guess, left or right on boundary, I guess, and that is morning drop off at that school. That seminary if he turns it into storage. Yeah, right. Alley's seminary and then Hunt is. That's it. Sorry, Hunt. So you get on on seminary. Uh, sem you 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 travel, I guess, in a northerly direction on the alley, which would be. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of hard looking at the site plan, but you travel north on that alley. Gotcha. Thanks, Chad. All right. Any other questions for staff or, or the applicant or make sure? All right. Uh, any uh, deliberations, thoughts? This is a request for a variance, so there are, is no um, staff recommendation. Uh, Tisha, do you have something? I will just say from personal experience that that alleyway is, is quite congested uh, already as it is um, with traffic going to and from that school. Um, and as is Hunt Street and Seminary and also behind public hardware. All that stuff is really congested during the school hours of time based on my experience of having uh, gone back and forth there many years. But um, that's just my opinion. 
traffic. Mr. Lacey, you have it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> oops. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we're talking about four feet, right? Uh, it's 16 feet instead of 20 feet for the front. That's what we're talking about is four feet. And then the additional thing we're talking about is egress uh, and entrance from in the lower level through the alley. And transportation has already said, yes, it can happen. So I'm sure they've uh, done due diligence as the professionals they are. And I don't really see that there's a barrier. And we're talking about four feet. We're not talking about um, putting a, 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 a garage entrance or exit right at the corner, which would be, I think, dangerous because when you come around the corner, you don't know that there's going to be a car waiting to get on. So I think that they've done the best they could do with the, uh, to accommodate all of the needs. So I'm going to vote in favor of it. Thank you, Mr. Lacey. Any other thoughts? Uh, Mr. Tanner. This is Chad. Um, you know, this is a use that's allowed. Um, I think they've tried to be judicious in the provision of parking. Um, from the testimony received, it was the city that was compelling them to, to put this entrance on, on, on Mangum um, because the alley is too small uh, to accommodate um, the traffic. They did relocate the trash, uh, the moving area to the back. So to me, that was a move that signals consist, uh, an attempt for, for consistency. Um, you know, the, I, I agree with, um, with Ms. DeLacy regarding the de minimis nature of the, the second variance. Um, doesn't seem like that's a, a major, uh, a fatal flaw in the request. And they ha have done some design consideration to, to try to address, you know, that, that uh, address the city requirements. Um, so I, I too, I'm, I'm going to support this if we want to um, densify downtown uh, and want to provide housing alternatives um, and have to recognize people still drive cars um, and that those cars have to operate on the tra transportation system that we have, maybe not the one that we want, um, then compromises like this have to happen. Thank you. Well said, Mr. Meadows. Uh, Mike Tan. I, um, I, I completely agree with, with Mr. Meadows and Mr. Lacey, and, and I'd like to thank the applicant team for a, a very thorough and clear presentation and, and walking through each of these findings. I, I think you, you know, certainly helped um, provide a good, good overview of what, what we're considering here today. Um, you know, I, I am certainly also supportive of this. I, I feel like, you know, while we're talking about four feet on the building corner, um, it might be a different situation that this property was actually on the corner of an intersection, but having pulled the, the building back 10 feet from the property line, you actually are, you know, 24 feet from the property corner versus, um, you know, the, just the 16 from the, the physical corner of the building. So um, this not being a service, i.e. trash and loading, um, you know, where you have trucks backing into and out of the right of way, I think, I think you've done a, done a great job meeting that particular criteria. Um, so, uh, again, I appreciate it. I'm supportive of this, uh, this application. All right. Uh, anyone else? Retchless. I concur with Mr. Turret and, um, Chad, um, Ms. DeLacy, well-spoken and, uh, to preserve more time, I will not speak, but, uh, I am for the variance. All right. Um, if there's no more discussion, does anyone want to offer a motion? Mr. Lacey? Mr. Lacey. I hereby make a motion that the application number B21 bunch of zeros 10, an application for a request for a variance from the requirements to not place a service area along a street frontage and for service area to be 20 feet from the building corner on property located at 509 North Mangum Street has successfully met the applicable requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and is hereby granted subject to the following conditions 
that the improvements shall be substantially consistent with the plans and all information submitted to the board as part of the application. All right, we've got a motion to approve by Mr. Lacey. Is there a second? Gretchless second. Uh, second by Mike Gretchless. Susan, will you take it over? Mr. Lacey? Yes. Mr. Kip? Yes. Mr. Meadows? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Retchless? Yes. Ms. Wymore? Yes. Mr. Tarrant? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. A vote of seven to zero. Your variance has been approved. Um, uh, we'll get a formal order soon, and we appreciate you coming before the BOA this afternoon. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. Good. Continue on our agenda here. I see no old business. I see no new business. And now to the approval of orders. Lacey, I have new business. Oh, you've got new business. Let's hear it. Yes, this will be my last meeting. Um, I've uh, submitted Ray recommend, uh, my resignation to the mayor. Um, it's been a great ride, uh, eight years here, two years another sworn committee and uh, the other 15 and various boards and commissions. Um, and so I'd like to thank you all for being, this is the hardest job of any committee or I've been on. And I really appreciate the professionalism of these volunteers who just care for the city and the county. Um, so thank you all for your service. So Regina, what if we don't, we don't accept your resignation, huh? Too bad, buddy, <laughs> Stevie already did. <laughs> but no. thank you for the kind net words. <laughs> I truly appreciate your, your commitment to this, uh, to this group. And as well as, you know, as your uh, two years as chair as well, uh, uh, just before me. So uh, wish you nothing but the best, but, but it's going to be honey. Nice. You go. Okay, now you can do the order. All right, about the orders, um, the first one, the only, there are three of you who can vote uh, and make a motion. Uh, that's going to be Mike Tarrant, Ian Kip, and Chad Meadows on this one. Uh, so uh, this is from the previous meeting. B2, uh, need a motion and a, and a second for each of these, uh, but B2000051, is there a motion to approve from one of those three people? Meadows, move approval. Meadows first. Who's the second? Tarrant second. Oh, can't make, okay, Terrence, second. Susan, you wanna take it away? Did you say the only three people that could vote was Delacy, one more, nope. and- Nope, uh, not Mike, me. Tarrant, Kip, and Meadows. Uh, Gina not, with us. Cannot vote, those three. Can vote, those are the only can't three. Vote. Okay, yeah. Mr. Kip? Yes. Mr. Meadows? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Nope. Mr. Retchless? No, nope, I, I can't, I can't vote. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just, uh, just the three, uh, uh, Tarrant, Kip, and Meadows are the only people who can vote. Can. Okay, let me start right. this over. Mr. Tarrant? Yes. Mr. Kip? Yes. Mr. Meadows? Yes. Motion carries three to zero. All right. Uh, our next one is B2000049. Everyone who was seated today is, is eligible to vote on this one. Need a motion and a second. Meadows, move approval. Meadows Lacey first. second. Delacy second. Okay. Ms. Delacy? Yes. Mr. Kip? Yes. Mr. Meadows? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Retchless? Yes. Why more? Yes. Mr. Tarrant? Yes. All right. Mr. Carey, seven to zero. B21000003. Everyone is also eligible to vote on this one. Need a motion and a second. Meadows, move approval. Meadows, who's the Red. second? Retchless is the second. Ms. DeLacy? Yes. Mr. Kip? Yes. Mr. Meadows? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Retchless? Yes. Ms. Wymore? Yes. Mr. Tarrant? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. All right, and our next one will be B21000005. Uh, Chad is can't vote on this one. He voted no. So um, uh, from the other six, uh, we'll need a uh, motion and a second. Delacy, so move. Delacy, and who's in the second? Kip, Kip second. Kip, second. Miss uh, Miss Delacy. Yes. Mr. Kip. 
Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Retchless? Yes. Ms. Wymore? Yes. Mr. Tarrant? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. All righty. Uh, our next one will be B21000009. Everyone's eligible to vote on this one. Need a motion in a second. Motion, Retchless. Retchless first. Who's a second? DeLacy. Miss DeLacy. Mr. Tarrant? Yes. Miss Wymore? Yes. Mr. Retchless? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Meadows? Yes. Mr. Kipp? Yes. Miss DeLacy? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. All right, our final one is B21000010. Again, everyone's eligible to vote. I need a motion and a second. Hold on, Krista. Um, Krista Kuko, City Attorney's Office. Since there was opposition on that one, uh, I believe it would be appropriate to come back with an order on it. That's right, that's right. All right, well, we won't vote on that one right now. Uh, well, Regina, I don't want you to go. Oh, that's sweet, honey. Uh, it's been a good run, but um, it was time. Yeah, I understand. Completely understand. It's good to have you here. Uh, 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 let's, I don't know what else to say about that. Regina, thank you for the peer support. And um, you're definitely a great role model to follow. And uh, you've helped me out a lot on this board. Thank you. Yeah, it means a lot coming from you, Michael. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your leadership. You've been wonderful to work with. I'm really happy to have met you. I and I you and I love your comfy chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Regina. You're uh, awesome. Thanks, Regina from staff. Thanks, Eliza. You've been swell. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great working with you as chair and as a member. So many wishes in your next endeavor. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, our next meeting will be April 27th at 8.30 a.m. Uh, until then, I will see you then. Is there a motion for adjournment? DeLacy, so move. <laughs> Have a second. Have a second. All in favor, aye. Aye. See Bye, you guys. Good day. It's been fun.